Hello, kings, queens, nerds, and geeks. Powder Milk here, er, and welcome back to Fallout Equestria. Now, guys, um, I would have done the episode yesterday, but I was not fully prepared. Now that I am fully prepared, er, because as the reason why this is a bit uh, off, because you could tell this video is going to be over two hours, uh, probably maybe longer than that, since because uh, uh, since my mid talking and stuff like that. Well, anyway, also, guys, ignore the uh, noises in the background. That we just got a new washer and dryer today, and it's pretty, it's pretty cool. So it's pretty nice. So um, anyway, where we left off is where Little Pit was get was trying is trying to get over the massacre at Arbu, and I was and you guys can obviously see me fucking. Uh, what's the word? No, I was just say that I was getting emotional over the story and we're gonna get over to chapter 36 the very strange tale of midnight shower so i don't know i, I don't know if that's a person or if that's like an event or a specific day a or a specific thing so i'm about to find out what it is so here we go blam the blood wing screeched as the bullet from my sniper rifle tore through its abdomen. The dark shadow tucked in its wings, spiraling downward, disappearing into the storm. Sheets of rain lashed across the sky bandit. I was relying more on sats than my own vision. Above us, Steelhose was doing the same. The rhythmic booming of his grenade machine gun and the shrieks of the blood wings filled the air. Where the hell did they all come from? Calamity shouted firing the twin guns on his battle saddle as the dark form of one of the giant bats swooped up in front of us. There were far more than the dozen I had originally counted. This was a whole damned flock. I heard the thud as one of them landed on Steelhoves above, biting at his armor in a futile effort to pierce it. Another swirled up out of the rain and slammed into the side of the sky bandit, rocking it and sending me tumbling backwards off the bench I had perched on. My sniper rifle clattered to the ground. Green flame erupted across the side of the Sky Bandit, the burning blood wing letting out an ear-splitting screech of agony and falling away as the heavy rain washed away the flames. Pyrolite flashed through the air, piercing the air with a battle cry as she dove after it. I blinked, struck by the impression that the Balefire Phoenix had a vengeful hatred for the creatures. Another blood wing latched itself onto the opposite side of the passenger wagon, viciously thrusting its head into one of the windows, gnashing at us. Velvet Remedy's combat shotgun roared, and I was Damn. splattered with what had once been inside of the creature's head. Damn! As Zenith knocked the body of the Bloodwing away, I threw myself to my hooves, leaving the sniper rifle and drawing out little Macintosh. We were in the thick of them now, and Applejack's trusty little revolver was the fastest and most powerful weapon I had. For a moment, I felt bad for our zebra. Her fighting style was absolutely useless in this kind of situation. I leapt to the window, slipping into sats and taking aim with the first dark shadow I saw. Blam. Blam. The first shot went through the blood wing's back. The second tore a hole in its left wing. It fell from the sky, only for another one to take its place immediately, lunging towards my window in particular. Blam. 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 The creature's momentum carried his body into the side of the sky bandit with a meaty thump. I heard the impact of meat on metal as a tearing sound ensued. The black mass of two blood wings tumbled into the drenched air behind us, steel hose entangled between them as they fell, disappearing into the torrential Why are there so many blood wings? I cried out, throwing out a telekinetic net, but he was already gone. And a few seconds later, several more blood wings were swirling around us. One of them was engulfed in green flame from beneath. A few yards back, Zenith kicked open the door to the passenger wagon, staring out at the black forms whipping about us in the blankets of rain. Before I realized what she was planning, the zebra leapt, soaring out into the air and landing onto the back of one of the giant bats. She drove the spear of her hellhound helmet through the monster's head, then jumped from its falling corpse towards the nearest opponent. And I felt sorry for her, I thought, watching as she impacted the creature's wing and slashed it off with her hellhound claw horn before falling into the darkness where more unsuspecting blood wings awaited. I should feel sorry for her enemies. I just realized that's the equivalent to the death claw. A giant bat dove onto Gauntlet. Calamity its huge wings dwarfing his own. I spun, targeting, and fired. Blam. Click, click. 
Little Macintosh's remaining bullet tore into the monster. It squealed. Calamity tried to buck it off, but the bat sank its huge razor-sharp fangs into the Pegasus. Calamity screamed. Velvet Remedy galloped past me, firing repeatedly with her combat shotgun, tearing the monster to pieces before it could drink. The Sky Bandit lurched in the air. Calamity was hurt badly, and the ripped corpse of the giant bat was still latched onto him. But he wasn't dead. A moment later, I saw how horribly close he had come to dying. The Sky Bandit dropped, jolting with turbulence as Calamity fought to land. The ground came into view, and I could see the two figures we had rushed in to save. Two young zebras, no older than the young mare with the Arbu mark, clear glass. Oh my God. As I reloaded, a bloodwing dropped on one of the zebras, knocking her to the ground. I tried to move faster, but it took only a second. So you were saving zebras. The monster plunged its fangs into the zebra's side and drank. The zebra withered into a desiccated husk faster than her brain could die. No, damn it, no! I howled, snapping little Macintosh shut. I targeted the monster with sats as it cavorted over its kill. But the blood wing was torn apart by a charging zenith faster than I could pull the trigger. I do not understand, Zenith said. Why were there three of you traveling in such dangerous hills, and in such a storm? We were all huddled together under the glittering dome of Velvet Remedy's shield spell. I watched as barrels of rain cascaded down over the barrier of light, struck by the strange sense of beauty from it. The surviving young zebra had been dried by repeated use of Velvet's cleaning spell, as had we all, and was wrapped in a blanket from our supplies, which needed similar deep drenching. Well, Zenith had built yeah. a fire and was sitting next to it, across from the other zebra. A pot of purely vegetable soup beginning to bubble between them. The young zebra had just seen his two childhood friends die in the most horrible manner. He needed more than a blanket. I knew it wasn't much, but I had come to believe in the miraculous power of hugs. Zenith, however, didn't hug. Zenith didn't touch unless it was to hurt something. Velvet Remedy was tending to Calamity's wounds, using her magic and Zenith's bleed-stopping goop to remove the fangs embedded in the Pegasus's back safely before medical potions could be administered. None of us had seen any sign of our Applejack's ranger. Getting up, I trotted over to the young zebra buck and lay down next to him. I'm what so happened sorry, to steel hooves? I whispered. We... I should have been faster. I paused. Unsure if suddenly embracing this strange zebra was the best thing for him after all. And, to my shame, a tiny part of my mind warned that I had been fooled into caring for evil folk before. I mentally dropped an anvil on that part of me, and then banished it to the moon. Instead, I put a tender hoof on one of his, holding it gently. Just a simple touch. He started, looking first surprised, then grateful. We had to, he said at last. We were too old. Looking at Zenith, he questioned. You are not from Glyphmark. Glyphmark? Zenith asked. The younger zebra nodded. I am sad to say I do not know of this place. This is a zebra village. <clears throat> what do you mean, too old? Calamity asked while grunting. <clears throat> he gritted his teeth as Velvet Remedy pulled the second fang free and quickly applied a hoof covered in Zenith's mixture to the flowing wound. The zebra looked at us strangely. Who are you, ponies? Friends, I answered gently. He looked at me with suspicion, then sadness. My friends are dead. He turned to Zenith. Quoth and Zuna had been my friends since we could walk. We did everything together. We even... We even got our marks together. He choked, tears forming in his young eyes. We... We got kicked out of the tribe together, too. Now I hugged him. I held him and let him sob into my side. The downpour finally relented, leaving a light drizzle in its wake. I looked into the sky, turning my gaze towards the mountains. There, nestled in the open jaw of a cliff, were the darkened spires of the Canterlot ruins. We could be there in hours if we wanted to, but instead we were going the other way. Velvet Remedy's beautiful voice sang across the hilltops. 
No more living in this gilded cage, shackled to what is supposed to be. I'm ready to exit this stage, it's time for this bird to fly free. Calamity cut him with perfect timing, his voice a pleasant counterpoint to the luxurious voice of the unicorn mare. I've been blinded cause I've closed my eyes, seeing just what they told me to see. Time to get up and shake off the lies, break their rules, stretch my wings and just leave. Together they belted forth the chorus of their duet, their voices daring the slate gray sky and the ceaseless rain to even try to make the day gloomy for them. I'd missed this. We were trotting towards Glyphmark. Calamity flew alongside me, pulling the sky band at no more than a pony's height above the ground. The mere idea of boarding the flying thing had driven the young zebra to panic, so we walked, escorting him towards his new home. It was better this way anyway, I thought. I had been cooped up in that passenger wagon for days, recovering physically from my head trauma and psychologically from the most soul-destroying worst day ever of my lifetime. Physically, I was healed. Mentally, well, I was capable of pushing on. What I had done would never quite heal. The reality of that turned my thoughts to steel hoofs. Another reason to walk. I had to trust he would find us, and when he did, it would be best if we were on the ground. Otherwise, he might just shoot a missile to get our attention. I cannot hope to change things if I do not even try. I cannot heal another if I just lay down and die. There's a whole world beneath us. And a whole sky above. As the voices of Velvet Remedy and Calamity joined forces once more for the last line of the verse, in another rousing chorus, I turned to my zebra companion. Zenith trotted along beside me, the young one between us. Do you still wish to seek out the tribe itself? There is no need, Zenith intoned gravely. My daughter is no longer with them. The young zebra had wept openly, unable to stop once he had started. He had blubbered, sobbing and mourning the loss of his friends. And in the spaces between his words, I began to construct a picture of what had happened. The trio of friends had come from the tribe that Zenith's daughter had once been a part of, the tribe that formed from those who were left behind when the slavers fell upon Zenith and her village. Zebra foals, all of them. My parents and husband were slain in the fight, Zenith had told us. My daughter was too young for Stern's slave pits, and she had no place in Red Eye schools, so Stern left her there, along with the other children. An entire tribe of children living under the shared belief that being an adult meant being ripe for slavers, that having adults in the tribe invited attack. And while the slavers might not take the children, that didn't mean that they wouldn't do much more horrible things to them instead. And just how did they decide when a zebra is suddenly too old? Calamity had asked. The answer was obvious. It wasn't a matter of birthdays. It was a matter of maturity. You were too old when you got your mark just like in Staple 2. When you got your cutie mark, you were an adult, and from that moment, you joined the workforce. Only here, in the Zebra tribe, it was a dreaded event. Okay. I was always curious about how, how Zebra's, the Zebra's mark on their flank is. I, I thought it was a cutie mark, but it wasn't. But it's actually something else. It means something else to them. It's probably something in a language that they have or whatever. But apparently it's also meaning something. Their marks represent adulthood, kind of like the cutie mark does. Their form of puberty. Excuse me. Anyway, let's continue. I nodded to Zenith. She had suffered in the slave pits for many years since the attack on her village. Her daughter was young, but hardly an infant, and the zebra with us only vaguely recalled when the mare had herself been ostracized from the tribe. If she still lives, my daughter will be in Glyphmark. Glyphmark sucked. I looked down the hill at the rows of sad, dilapidated shacks with their sunken roofing leading up to the half-collapsed building in a yard of junk. The whole town was surrounded by a wall of scrap that looked like it couldn't keep a rad hog out. The ground was dark and lifeless mud. The hoofful of zebras looked battered and dejected, 
their eyes downcast, their heads low, their manes and tails tangled and unkempt. It looked like a town that was just waiting to die in the wasteland. I could make out the letter spelling Angel on the front of the ruined building, the last remaining word of a forgotten name. Whatever angel had once watched over this town, it had fallen. As we approached, the zebras looked up fearfully. I saw two of them nudge a third forward. The mare steps towards us. We surrender, just, just don't kill us, she called out. We don't have anything, but take whatever you want. I could feel my barely mended heart breaking. This is Glyphmark, Zenith asked in a tone of disbelief. The young zebra buck with us nodded, rocking slightly on his hooves, looking sucker bucked. Felt a remedy trotted forward. Hello, she said gently, her voice calming. Do not be afraid, we mean no harm. We're just travelers who happened to cross a newly marked buck and offered to help him make his way here safely in all the rain. Conflicting emotions swam across the faces of the zebras. I could tell how desperate they were for the approaching strangers to intend no malice, yet how hard it was for them to believe. Having brought him here, we will all depart at once if you wish, although I would ask your indulgence. We have trotted far and seek a safe place to rest. Safe? The zebra mare asked, her voice cracking with a bitter laugh. Pony lady, there is no safe here. We're all just waiting for the slavers to come. The only question is whether the raiders or the monsters will have left any of us alive for them when they get here. She waved us into the town anyway. With every step, the town got worse, bleaker, as if despair and hopelessness had sunk into the very planks of the shacks like the cloud and was radiating out of it. How do you all survive here? Velvet asked, her voice almost a whimper. I knew what she was seeing. There were no crops here. No gardens. The zebras were armed with crude spears and small, badly maintained pistols that were no match against creatures like bloodwings. These were not hunters, trappers of small game at the best. The zebras were all emaciated. I could see the shadow of their bones through their coats. They were all starving. When Velvet put words to her observations, the nearest zebra responded. Nothing grows here. This town is just close enough to Cantalot that the cloud has poisoned the ground. At our looks of alarm, she added, but far enough away that it is not in the air anymore. The zebra mare who had ushered us into the town explained, The building up there was a laboratory for veterinary medicine. I was surprised by how educated she sounded. The tribe of children was far better off than those who they kicked out. But I had to wonder how long that could last. Without adults, there would be no replenishing of the tribe. In a few more years, the tribe wouldn't be a tribe anymore. Just one child telling the other to go away. There's an old hydroponics bay in the basement. Most of what they were growing down there is poisonous, though. The zebra mare stared at the ground and shuddered heavily. We learned that the hard way. But we've been surviving on what was not, and what was left in the vendor machines. But even that is almost gone now. I'm sorry, but we have nothing to feed you. Velvet Remedy waved a hoof. Banish the thought. We have some supplies. Let us feed you. I exchanged looks with Calamity, then nodded. Those supplies were meant to feed us while in Cantalot and on the trip back. But these zebras clearly needed them far more than we did. And in comparison to me, they were far more deserving. None of them had slaughtered a whole town in blind rage recently. Pip, please stop going and back their to suffering that. made mine look petty in comparison. Veterinary medicine? Calamity questioned as we drew close to the building. What had looked like scrap from a distance still looked like scrap up close. But it was clearly military scrap. Broken down military robots huddled around war chariots so rusted and decayed that they were barely recognizable. Piles of empty ammo boxes littered one corner as well as parts of several turret models. A much larger version of the flying contraption we discovered in Old Olney was strewn across half of the lot, upside down. Stone pillars flanked the scant remains of a road leading into the yard around it. A cracked placard read, Angel Bunny Pharmaceuticals. The name was not so forgotten after all. 
I remembered Xanth's claims that Fluttershy's pet rabbit had created the combat drug Stampede, and I found myself wondering if the rabbit had somehow built this company. Then I face-offed at my own foolishness. Knowing what I did to Fluttershy, it was the most natural thing for the Ministry of Peace to have a branch dedicated solely to the welfare of animals. And of course she would have it named after her favorite pet. The military took over, I surmised, as I spotted the hulk of a sentinel robot. I wondered if part of this lab was repurposed for creating Stampede. With a start, I realized that the poor zebras in this town were living under the shadow of doom. Bunny. The irony was so bitter I had to bite back a laugh. Well, what about trade? Calamity asked. No caravans stop here, the zebra mare told us. There is nothing here that any pony wants, and we have nothing to buy supplies with. Velvet Remini gasped in horror as a zebra hobbled out of one of the shacks, teetering on only three legs. The remains of the fourth looked badly infected. You don't have a doctor either, do you? Not anymore. We made a full circle. There wasn't much of the town to see. Our host waved a forehoof. Sleep wherever you want. Is this all? Zenith asked slowly as another zebra walked by, eyeing us curiously. I found myself staring. The zebra had used charcoal to outline her stripes so heavily that she looked like a black-coated zebra with white stripes, rather than the reverse. Don't mind Bloom, our guide told us dismissively. Zenith shook her head. Are there no other zebras here? The zebra mare shook her head. The other zebra mare, Gloom, turned. The Nightmare Moons took them, six nights ago. They're all dead now. Wish I was. The Nightmare Moons took them, I asked. Our host nodded. They came and took half of us. I do not know why. They have never paid any attention to us before. Zenith looked pained. Was one of those taken named Zephyr? The striped mare blinked at Zenith. Yes? No, at no, Zenith's no, no. stricken expression, the other zebra turned away, looking instead to Velvet Remedy. She was our doctor. I pushed forward, catching the zebra mare's attention. Which way did they go? You do not have to try to rescue them just because one of them is my daughter, Zenith said as I reloaded my guns. Nor because you feel you need to make up for the cannibal town. Right, I agreed, slipping little Macintosh back into its holder. We need to do this because it's the right thing to do. Yep, Calamity agreed, trotting up next to us clad in his enclave armor minus the helmet. He'd spent a lot of his spare time since Old One jury-rigging a way to fire the Nova Surge rifles without wearing the helmet. Plus, uh, I hate to say, but this might be on us. I stopped. What? I stared at Calamity. Well, I reckon the goddess ain't stupid, Calamity responded. She figured out she's got a blind spot, and she's, uh, experimenting. This... This had to do with the memories I had stolen from myself, didn't it? Well, if it wasn't settled before, I'm going to stay. I turned to Velvet in surprise. The unicorn shook her head. These people need a doctor. Not when you come back with theirs, but now. It's been five days since the Alicorns attacked Liftmark, and that is five days too many. I could see it in her eyes. She believed that she had something to make up for, and she wasn't going to turn away from another pony or zebra in need. I just stepped forward and gave her a hug. Stay safe. I should be the one telling you that, she replied. Pyrolite landed on a rusty barrel next to us and hooted quizzically. Velvet gave the beautiful bird a nuzzle before saying, Go with them, please, Pyrolite. Keep them safe. The bird nodded, giving a little salute with one of her wings. <laughs> Looking to Calamity, Velvet demanded, Bring them all back without any new holes. I'll do my best, he said, tipping his hat. I released Velvet Remedy and turned towards Zenith and Calamity. So, do either of you know anything about this place we're headed? 
Zebra Town. The answer from both of them was an unsurprising no. Once more, we were headed into the unknown. It felt like it had been raining forever. I was panting as we ascended yet another hill, rethinking the wisdom of walking to Zebra Town. Hearing that Zebra Town was only an afternoon's trot away, Calamity had suggested we travel on hoof, and I had agreed, suspecting the Sky Bennett would be too visible and the Alicorns would be looking for it. Now I realized the idea of trotting back over these muddy hills with freed zebras in tow and possibly Alicorns chasing us was just stupid. I heard a whistle from the air above us. It didn't help that Calamity wasn't exactly traveling on hoof. Looking down, I saw another little valley with spots of asphalt indicating a nearly vanished road. There was an ancient stone hut down there amongst the collapsed sections of fence. The body of a dead bloodwing sprawled over the roof, and a second was impaled on the iron struts of what had, until recently, been a windmill. A figure was galloping towards us from the door of that hut, clad in metal armor striped in applejack red. The whole big valley landed, and they managed to hit the one hut. Calamity shouted to him, grinning. I raced down the hill to meet him, Zenith following at a more reserved pace. You better watch out, Calamity warned as I reached Seal Hoofs. She's gotten kind of huggy lately. Hmm. I seem to recall it was you who hugged her first. The Applejacks range retorted. Hold on, retorted. hold on, hold on, guys. Welcome what? Hint of Sorry about that, guys. Had to settle something. Good humor in his normally taciturn rumble. Several minutes later, we stepped into the little two-room hut to get out of the continuing drizzle. Whoa, Calamity said, echoing my own sentiment as he came to a stop. Rainwater dribbling off the brim of his desperado hat. I'd seen enough of the ravages of time and the scattered refuse that was left behind after generations of scavengers. This wasn't it. Pictures were slashed apart. Furniture was smashed under hooves. Small treasures had been defiled. I had also seen the malicious destruction of raiders. The wreckage in the cottage was much closer to that, but this wreckage was old, bearing all the signs of predating the apocalypse. The torn pictures were so faded with age they were unintelligible. The furniture was rotting. The stuffing and the ripped pillows had turned to dust, presuming they were not stuffed with dust to begin with. It gets worse, Steelhose warned. I stepped farther inside, and the turn of a corner revealed the collapsed remains of a skeleton on the floor, beneath a hanging noose. Any physical clue as to whether the owner of that skeleton had hung himself or had been lynched had been obliterated by the past. Him or her? Calamity kicked over a pile of broken chairs, then trotted into the kitchen to see if there was anything worth saddlebagging in the fridge. A minute later, I heard the pop and hiss of an opening cola bottle. Clearly, his search had borne fruit. I poked at a terminal laying amongst the rubble, its screen smashed in by a hoof. Then stopped, taking a closer look. It was one of those newer models I had been finding operational everywhere. And upon closer examination, this terminal was still running. Whoever destroyed it had fallen prey to the common yet silly misconception that breaking the screen had any effect on the device's spell matrix. Calamity trotted back in, holding a sunrise sarsaparilla in his teeth and taking a swig. I floated out a few tools and crouched next to the terminal. Sunrise sarsaparilla. Steelers regarded Calamity. Are we on a date? Calamity spit his sarsaparilla, spraying it around the neck of the bottle as he choked. <coughs> what now? He said, dropping the bottle, tears in his eyes. I stopped what I was doing, stared, then collapsed in laughter. Served him right. I had assumed you had seen the decoration on the roof and were coming to find me, Steelers noted. But now I see you're all dressed up. Beating at his armored chest with a hoof, the Pegasus shook his head, coughing. Once he had his breath again, he answered, Nah, we're headed up to Zebra Town to save a hoof full of prisoners from Alicorns. I noticed he didn't mention the prisoners were zebras. So you with us, mighty Alicorn Hunter? I'd almost forgotten that title. 
Seals was strangely silent. I looked at him, wondering if I should be concerned. Was he thinking of Arbu again? Zebra Town. Steel was voiced slowly. E yep. I would rather not. There was an unpleasant tension in his voice. I looked at Zenith, who just shook her head sadly and walked back out into the rain. But I will, Steelo said, sounding greatly displeased. It is what Applejack would have her rangers do. I nodded, feeling both sorrow and pride in our cool companion. <laughs> I turned back to the terminal, connecting it to my pit buck and running a quick diagnostic. You gotta give props to Steelhoos. He had to give... He had to put his bigotry to his side and actually do a bit of kindness. Which I, I'll give props to Steel Who's. And I, didn't, I just realized that... I don't know why I didn't put the two and two together that Steel Who's is racist to zebras, but... There he is. But... My eyebrow shot up as I realized the terminal was safeguarded with some pretty heavy magical countermeasures. I was sure I could hack it, but the price of failure would be more than a simple lockout. I turned away from the others and put my full focus on the terminal hacking it through my pit buck. After a few minutes, I had to back out and try again. I hadn't encountered a terminal with this level of security since the Ministry of Morale in Manhattan. Now, I was intensely curious. Why would the pony, or zebra, living in such a humble hut have need for a terminal with security that rivaled that of the mayor of the Ministry of Morale? A few minutes later, I backed out again, just barely avoiding tripping the security spells embedded in the terminal. This was insane. The damn password was 30 characters long. The fuck? I tried a third time. And a fourth. By my fifth try, I was beginning to suspect that the terminal only existed to frustrate the living hell out of me. Xanath returned, several strips of leathery flesh from the Bloodwing's wings dangling in her mouth. Huh. She shook, flinging water all over the rest of us then put the script in her satchel, ignoring nasty looks from a dripping calamity. On my sixth attempt, I finally broke in. Whew. The password was Astronomical Astronomer's Almanac. I felt a brief flash of empathy for whoever put their hoof through the terminal screen. The terminal had not weathered the years well, far worse than most similar models, but that was to be expected with part of its innards exposed. Still, there were a number of files that I was able to download into my pit buck, including several entries from a journal. From the Journal of Midnight Shower. Day 1. Today is the first day of my mission-imposed exile from the refined walls of Canterlot. I arrived in Zebra Town at the stroke of eight, the Royal Guards dropping me and my bags off at a small trot from the city limits. I did not blame them for not wishing to travel closer. And with celestial sun shining above and a cool breeze coming off the mountains, the day invited a walk. My levitation spell is enough to care for my possessions for such a short distance and prevent the walk from being a burden. Although, I admit, I was a little concerned for the safety of the priceless heirloom with which I have been entrusted. I would say that this is a fair town by Equestria's standards, but Zebra Town does not hold itself to such standards at all, now does it? Still, it is far better than the complete hovel I expected. I had heard that there was a town somewhere out in the dirtier parts of Equestria that the Earth Ponies had built in merely a year. Well, if that is true, then maybe there's a little earth pony in the zebras. And I do not mean that in an offensive or seditious manner. For in just a few years, they've turned a poverty-reeled shantytown at the very foot of Canterlot into something rather impressive. Most impressive, I must say, is the elevating aqueducts that runs up the mountain and directly under Canterlot, catching the water which spills continuously from our glorious capital's moat and distributing it not only through the town, but to the farmland beyond. And to think that this entire place was not even a concept not so long ago. But then, there was no real need for segregation until the zebras massacred our children at Littlehorn. Not that I believe the zebras who are upstanding equestrian citizens should all be moved here, mind you. There are plenty of zebras back in Canterlot. I even have a friend who is a zebra. But in the more backward bumpkin parts of the kingdom, with the increasing anti-zebra war sentiment, it simply isn't safe for them to be amongst normal ponies. It really is better this way. 
That said, I was pleased to learn that the hut which Princess Luna had provided for the duration of my research here is actually a few miles outside of the town proper. As for the hut itself, it's... cozy. Far from the refinements and luxuries I have been accustomed to in the castle. But I am a scholar, not a noble. And so I have it in my blood to make do, being unburdened as I am with the nobility's allergy to anything plebeian. I have spent this afternoon getting settled in, including the task of troubleshooting the new terminal. Why is it that any piece of Arcano technology always seems to come with more headaches than the one that it replaces? Of course, a fair part of the difficulties may have arisen from the installation of a security spell submatrix, but considering the sensitive nature of my research, it would simply not do to have one of the striped ones with an unhealthy sense of curiosity going poking around in my affairs, now would it? Tomorrow, I shall trot back into Zebra Town and try to get acquainted with the town and its citizenry. Being able to establish a degree of good relations will be a critical part before pursuing avenues of inquiry. What can you tell us about Zebra Town? I asked Steelhose, having to shout to make my voice heard over the distant roar of rushing water. The Applejack Ranger's response was, Look up. I lifted my head, holding up a hoof to shield my eyes from the downpour. The drizzle of the last several hours had thickened, working towards another tempest. Dark mountain cliffs rose sharply above us. As my gaze ascended, I saw Canterlot. The broken majesty of the castle and surrounding city jutted out of the mountainside almost directly above us. I had expected it to be shrouded in a haze of pink, but the rain painted the ornate ruins in the same palette of drab grays as the rest of Equestria. Multiple waterfalls, violently engorged by the rain, plunged down from above with the roar of a thousand manticores. Follow the largest of the waterfalls, and it will lead you to Zebra Town. Steel has informed us. I watched the torrent plummeting downward parallel to the sheer cliffs until it met with a multi-arch structure, which reminded me oddly of the Philadelphia roller coaster, washing over it with an unending thunderous bellow. Although a few foothills still blocked our view of Zebra Town itself, the village was very close now. What's it like? I asked. The ghoul responded with a stereotypically laconic, yet ominous, bad. And here I expected him to say something even less helpful, like, wet. Steelhoof didn't rise to the bait. You've been told what happened to Canterlot, he said. When the first missiles were inbound, the princesses joined together to raise an alicorn shield over the entire city. The shield was massive. It had to be. They weren't just protecting the castle. There's an entire city up there you can't see as easily from below. I nodded. The royal castle was only the most visible landmark from below. Ministry Walk was in Canterlot, as was Princess Celestia's school for gifted unicorns, and who knew how much more. I could spot fragments of a winding road, switchbacks carved into the mountains for chariots and carriages to make the ascent. I was picturing it now, the princess's potent shield being bombarded awash with fire and shaken by explosions. I knew that Alicorn's shields hampered sound and vision, but I still want- Okay, off topic of what's going on here, I just had a sudden thought. What happened to Luna and Celestia? What happened to them when the bombs fell? I want to know. Did they die? Or did they become ghouls? Or do, are they still alive, not affected by the tarnish of, of time, as they usually are? I want to know. Have they changed, or are they dead? Because I don't really know. wondered what it must have been like for the ponies cringing inside. When the zebra's mega spell went off, the shield filled with the pink cloud, so thick you could not even see the shadow of the castle inside of it. In my mind's eye, I now saw Canterlot replaced on the cliff side by a solid pink bubble. Much like a gargantuan bubblegum flavored candy jawbreaker. Their shields continued to trap the pink cloud for several hours while the Steel Rangers and others attempted to evacuate the towns in these foothills. Zebra Town lies directly beneath Canterlot. It was hit the hardest when the shield went down. Steelhoof looked at me. You may want to consider this a dry run for Canterlot itself. From the Journal of Midnight Shower. My first attempts to befriend the residents of Zebra Town were met with suspicion and guarded politeness, but no hostility. 
and considering the state of things here, I regard that as a small triumph on my part. Aside from the differences in architecture, and of course the glaring stripedness of the inhabitants, I could almost have believed I was in some extremely poor backwater pony town. Ponyville, perhaps. Of the two things that stood out to me the most, the reluctant geniality of the population was something I could expect to find in almost any hub of civilization that has not yet ascended to the heights of society, where the thinness and chill of the air requires an extra coat of snobbery. The other matter was altogether more telling and more jarring, and that was how the war had left its hoofprint in Zebra Town, aside, that is, from the mere existence of this place. First, I found none of the patriotic posters or billboards that were beginning to dominate Canterlot. I hardly expected signs reminding the residents how much better and more virtuous they are than zebras, nor encouragements to join the war effort, but I was surprised not to find a single poster related to any of the ministries. In fact, the only hoofprint of the ministries in all of Zebraville is the occasional patriotic song belted out by one of those new sprite bots. There are a few of them bobbing around town. And just like the ponies of Canterlot, the zebras pay them little attention. Honestly, a song that inspires patriotism the first hundred times you hear it will inevitably stop doing so within the first one thousand. The other hoofprint is the presence of soldiers here. This, I am given to understand, is a very new development. Ever since the assassination attempt on Princess Celestia, the residents of Zebra Town have been subject to harassment from other ponies in nearby towns. Princess Luna has put her hoof down, stationing some of Equestria's finest in Zebra Town for the residents' protection and safety. The road to Canterlot had become a raging river. Calamity held me as we flew over the muddy waves, my horn glowing. Behind us, Steelhoves and Zenith rode an arched stone bridge which floated through the air behind us, surrounded by the glow of my magic. Centuries of these storms had torn the bridge from its original moorings and washed it into the valley where I had found it half buried in mud. Pyrolite flew along beneath it, taking advantage of the stone canopy, her occasional breaths of fire reflected by the churning water below. Seeing the river that the road had become, I again rethought our decision to leave the Sky Bandit behind. The little bridge had become my compromise. It was large enough to carry the prisoners we intended to free as well. And if the streets of Zebra Town were flooded, the stone bridge was less likely to float away while we were busy rescuing than the passenger wagon would be. Suddenly, my head began to pound. I felt a terrible tightness in my horn. Strange red tint flooded my vision. My magic wavered, threatening to implode. I tried to focus harder, but the throb in my head rose to a scream. Pyrolite lit out a screaming squawk. I was barely able to hear Steelhoof shouting to Calamity. Up. Higher. Faster. I felt the tug as Calamity grunted painfully, flapping his wings harder. I could hear Zenith let out an agonized moan. Then, as quickly as the torment had come, it was gone. The screaming pain in my head was gone. My hearing cleared. I gasped, blinking away tears in the swimming redness. I wiped the tears from my eyes and then stared at my hoof, aghast at the smears of red quickly washing away in the rain. I had been bleeding from my eyes. What, what was that? I felt Calamity relax, his flying shaky. Behind me, Zenith's voice seemed to shudder. By the ball sacks of a thousand star devils, what? who dropped the moon on us? Okay, that swear was just disturbing. Although her description was as apt as any. Hmm. Broadcaster, Steelhoof said, his voice betraying no hints that he suffered as we did. There are probably several scattered about, washed out of Canterlot by the rain. I glanced behind us at the river we had passed over. The broadcaster was somewhere under the waves. We couldn't have seen it. I couldn't even hear the static over the roar of the waterfalls. There had been no warning until the effect began to kill us. I turned my stare forward again as we crested the last hill. Zebra Town sprawled out before us. The ruins had been left undamaged by the war, only to be slowly battered down by the hoof of time and the constant floods. Most of the zebra huts had collapsed, leaving not even skeletons. A small maze of crumbling shops and zebra insulae lined the merchant roads, and a few larger buildings formed gray masses shrouded behind sheets of falling water. The largest waterfall from Canterlot, engorged by the storm, crashed into the widening mountain cliff less than a quarter mile from the edge of Zebra Town, its roar filling the air. 
The pounded aqueduct stood under the onslaught, delivering part of the waterfall's payload directly into the town along an elevated canal. But the structure which had survived hundreds of years under the falls had collapsed at several points within the town itself. The water now pouring into the streets instead of flowing out to the hills which had been the zebra's cropland. As we flew over the streets of Zebra Town, I saw veins of pink swirling in the water. The rain proved to be a double-edged sword, washing the pink cloud out of the air. We could remain outside safely, but we dared not set hoof in the shallow lakes that had once been streets. At least we'd be able to keep our armor on. I needed my pit buck to locate the zebras. I looked up to the Canterlot ruins above us, wondering what the rain was doing to the city above. Clearly, rains like this had happened many times before, and the pink cloud always returned. Steelers would have told us otherwise, but would entering Canterlot during a storm make our mission safer or more dangerous? From the Journal of Midnight Shower Day 3 I spent another day in Zebra Town, acquainting myself with the proprietors of several of the businesses where I may make later inquiries as well as presenting myself to the Zebra Constabulary within the Zebra Town Police Station. The local law was quick to inform me that Zebra Town operates under the same laws as the rest of Equestria, and that the Zebras are more than capable and willing to police their own. They offered to show me their vault of confiscated items and contraband if I had doubted their efforts. Believing I had gotten off on the wrong hoof, I swiftly assured them that I was not here on any matter of the ministries or military, and that I was just conducting personal research for a thesis. I received even more suspicious looks at that, as well as a rather rude inquiry as whether I was researching the inherent zebra inferiority, as if any pony would want or need to do such a thing. No, I reassured them, confiding instead that I was doing a study on zebra astrology. To my dismay, this produced an even worse reaction than the notion I was researching zebra inferiority, and it took all my not-so-inconsiderable charisma and social graces to assure them that my studies were benign. Still, I left the encounter feeling a little shaken and slightly alarmed at the task before me. Hmm. The thoughts I find most particularly disquieting are the images my mind conjures of the locals' reaction should they learn the truth behind my research. So where do you expect them zebras are being held at? Calamity said as we flew over a large open area dominated on one end by a fountain with a statue in the form of Princess Celestia. Water pressure from the raging aqueduct was causing the fountain to blast streams of water from Celestia's eyes, wingtips, and horn, like they were pressurized hoses. I had my EFS up, but the only lights on my compass were my friends and the occasional pulse of red. I could never get a fix on the enemy, or enemies, that my EFS was picking up before they vanished again. It was making me nervous. There are not many structures left to hold them in, Zenith said the sight of the ruined zebra town having no apparent effect on her. I don't believe the Alicorns would choose one of the smaller shops as a base, Steelhoof noted. It doesn't fit their sense of ego. Well, that narrowed down the search areas considerably. On the other hoof, they could be using the zebra town sewers. And that just widened it a lot. Sewers? I moaned. That would explain why the town ain't even more flooded than this. Calamity appraised. I'm guessing they built them to handle spring flooding. Amongst other things. My compass flared red again as we swept over the broken rooftops of a row of zebra insulae and flew out over what had once been the Zebra Town Amphitheater, and was now a large inner city lake. Crumbling walls of columns and archways ringed the old amphitheater. Each column that still remained intact was crowned with stone carved masks of alien and almost unwelcoming designs. I cringed at the thought of attending a performance with those wicked-looking faces staring down at me from every column of the theater. Standing in one rain-shrouded archway was the near-black form of an alicorn. She saw us almost at the same moment we spotted her. Then she vanished with a flash. Fuck. It was one of the teleporting ones. Expect company, Steelers warned. We had to get out of the sky. We were too easy a target. Calamity flew towards the largest intact structure, dropping me onto the cracked rooftop before setting him down himself. Pyrolite darted out from under the stone bridge just before it slammed into the rooftop, spilling Steelhoofs and Zenith. The Applejack's ranger landed in a graceless thud, while the zebra somersaulted gymnastically, ending on all four hooves and turning to stare at the grumbling ghoul with a raised eyebrow and the slightest hint of a smirk. My fault, I called out as Steelhoofs pushed himself back up. 
A loud groan rumbled through the roof underneath my hooves. I knew immediately that it was about to collapse. It had been on the verge of crumbling for decades, and our landing was the final insult. Looking up at my companions, I whispered, I hate ceilings. Ceilings, roofs, floors, anything that could tumble out from underneath me. In all the fucking wasteland, they were my greatest enemy. Well, I started to focus, intent on levitating myself and my companions, and possibly laughing victoriously. Come on. The roof caved in, sending plumes of pink gas up towards us. My vision blurred, my head throbbed, and my lungs fought for proper air. My spell imploded, and I fell into the pink. My body hit the floor in a chamber of thick pink gas. The pink cloud had been seeping through the cracks in the ceiling and collected here. The medical assist spell in my pit buck started flashing warnings around my EFS as my internal organs began to suffer. My heart felt strained. My lungs struggled to take in enough air. I could feel something terribly unpleasant in my bowels. There will be pockets where the pink cloud has settled and pooled. Steelhives had warned us. Avoid them if you can. Dash through them with all haste if you cannot. While still only a fraction of the potency of the original cloud, such pockets will kill you in seconds. I pulled up my pit buck's auto map, checking my orientation towards the nearest door. This way! I tried to shout, my voice fighting for volume. Follow me! I charged for the door, praying the room beyond was safe. If it was not, I would likely be dead before I could find another. I hit the door, throwing it open. To my dismay, the hall beyond was curtained with the same cloying pink. Half of the doors along the way were open, offering no salvation. The pink cloud would kill me before I reached the end of the hall. Galloping to the first closed door, I screamed wretchedly as I found it locked. I was in no condition to pick a lock at the moment. I hurled myself at the next, my heart feeling like it was about to explode. My lungs were burning. My vision was getting dark. The door opened. I tore into the next room, praising Celeste as the pink cleared, only to thud against a stone railing. My EFS was still flashing warnings, and the compass was all manner of red. I needed a health potion to reverse the damage the pink cloud had done, and fast, before my organs started to fail. With severe alarm, I realized that Velvet Remedy still had all of our medical supplies. My vision was dark, but clearing. Calamity shot past me, hovering in the air just beyond the railing. As Steelhoves and Zenith galloped the door behind me, I heard a crunching sound from beneath. Looking around, I realized we were on a semicircular stone balcony overlooking a cavernous tiled room filled with water. Much of the water was shallow enough to wade through, but there were sunken pockets where I knew it was very deep. Streams of pink swam like ribbons through all the room. The room below us had several small tiers, the steps between becoming waterfalls, and hosted many balconies and exits. A dozen zebras looked up at our appearance with hostile expressions and dead eyes. Lovely choice, Zenith intoned, sounding terribly weak. If we wish to avoid the poisoned water, what better place than a bathhouse? The balcony shifted under our hooves. Oh, not again, I groaned, throwing my spell around myself and my companions as the tiled floor beneath us canted dangerously. The semicircle of stone tore from the wall, smashing down into the tiled floor below, shattering a hole in it. The four of us hovered over the bathhouse interior, surrounded by magic. Aha! I yelled down at the ruins of the balcony, ignoring the odd looks I was getting from Calamity. <laughs> I win! In response, a host of voices whinnied strangely from below. Several of the dead-looking zebras galloped towards the exits in the room beneath us. Water had begun to gurgle down into the hole created by the fallen balcony. The air filled with explosions as Steelhoves opened fire with his grenade machine gun, the grenades tearing the bodies of the zombie zebras apart. The room was filled with blasted water and flying chunks of tile and concrete. At least three of the dead zebras had made to an exit, but most died in the onslaught. Zenith cried out as one of the escapees came charging up in the pink hallway and leapt out with a still open door behind us, waves of pink mist curling out after it as it soared through the air and impacted with Steelhoves knocking them both out of my levitation field. The zombie zebra and the ghoul plunged into one of... Quick question, though. It, since... Um, 
since uh, Steel Hooves is a canterlock ghoul, does that mean he's immune to the cloud? I want to know. At the pools below with a splash. Well, he could use a bath. Xanth commented as we floated above the pool, watching the dark figures as the two hoof fought under the water, neither of them being able to drown. Y'all figure he needs any help? Calamity asked. We both shook our heads. Where's Pyrelight? I asked, suddenly realizing we were down a party member. Calamity scowled, blushing a little. Still flying around outside, I reckon. Bird's smart enough not to fall through a roof when she has wings. For Calamity's sake, I tried not to smirk. The floor around the pools was slowly draining. Casting about, I spotted a row of yellow medical boxes. Salvation. Assuming there were any health potions to be found inside. Telekinetically pulling myself away from the others, I flew up to the medical boxes. The first was unlocked, yet still full of medical supplies. Zebratown had not suffered the looting that had emptied nearly every other unlocked box in the wasteland. If this is what Zebratown was like, how about Canterlot? I suddenly understood Seelhoof's concerns about distractions. My head was still throbbing. My breathing was painful, fast and shallow. My gut twisting inside me as something seemed to shift, burning in my bowels. I didn't need the medical assist spell to know I was on the verge of something inside me failing. And I was the first one out of the cloud. My friends had to be worse. I floated the healing potions I found inside up to Calamity and Zenith, planning to use the first one I found in the next box myself. The next was locked. My vision slowly darkened further as I focused on the lock. A new red light sprung up on my EFS compass. Turning, I saw a zombie zebra push through a doorway, its seemingly lifeless eyes fixing on me, flaring with unholy light. I whipped out my zebra rifle, sending three bullets straight into its head. I could see the flare of orange flame as the corpse's brain burned. The zebra thing stumbled and went down like a sack of flour. Turning back to the medical box, I finally got it open. Celestia licked me like she loves me. Well then. There was a restoration potion inside of it. I downed one quickly before my. I swear, the more P I I swears, the more sexual they get. I, I swear. My vision could fade entirely, and I lost the ability to focus anymore. At once, my vision started to clear, my breathing became easier, my heart started to beat more strongly in my breast. My ears filled with an unnatural grating sound. I turned just as the dead zebra was lifting back to its hooves in a swirl of unholy energy. But, but I shot it in the head. With fire. The canterlot zebra proved just how much it didn't care as it struck out at me with a hoof. The impact bruised through my armor, sending my weightless body flying backwards. My head struck one of the medical boxes, exploding in pain and stars as I collapsed into the water. I could hear Zenith splash down as my magic imploded. I felt a sticky warmth in my mane, the medical assist flashing warnings of head trauma. Between my previous concussion and the weakening from the cloud, I feared I may have suffered permanent damage. The fear washed away as I passed out. From the Journal of Midnight Shower. Bearing in mind the extreme security on this terminal, and the sensitive nature of the charts and documents already stored within, I have decided that it should be safe to record the particulars of my assignment, and the discussion which led to my being thrust into this cultural wasteland. And by that, of course, I mean any place that is not Canterlot. I wish to do so now, while the words of the princess are still fresh in my head, before time and events further mar the memory. I suppose I could have a memory orb treatment, but such objects are terrifyingly lacking in proper security. Any unicorn could get into them, really. I should first note that I took this assignment willingly, even eagerly. There are some things that are simply more important to a pony than proper surroundings, proper meals, and proper company. And for every pony, the foremost of those things is their special talent, as magically emblazoned on their flank by their cutie mark. Sadly, there are ponies whose only talent in life is to be a stuck-up boar, or a rock farmer, or something equally as awful as that. But I had the unique misfortune of having the cutie mark of an event that would never occur within my lifetime. The last centennial meteor shower occurred over Ponyville ten years before I was even born, and the next is not scheduled to occur until decades after I am likely to have passed away. So the ability to not only see, but actually touch that very thing my cutie mark represents, 
to hold it in my hooves was just too overwhelming a gift to possibly turn away. Being a royal astronomer comes with many benefits, not the least of which is being within the same orbit as the princesses. I have been in the position to observe them in less than entirely formal company, and have even had occasion to speak to Princess Luna or Princess Celestian years prior to their beckoning. As such, I believe I have constructed a far better assessment of the character of each of the princesses than most any pony other than perhaps their royal guard, each other, and some of the castle staff. For example, Princess Luna is the younger sister. She's also the smaller and the cuter sister. Well... As a result of these traits, I have seen many ponies fall prey to the notion that she must also be the weaker and more innocent of the two. It is a misconception I have seen the princess herself play to on more than one occasion, usually with devastating precision. If anything can be said of the Night Princess, it is that she is certainly the darker of the two. In my personal estimation, ponies are often inclined to suspect Princess Celestia is capable of acts that our benevolent princess could never commit, and equally inclined to underestimate what Princess Luna is capable of. It was with these things in mind that many within the castle were fearful of what was to come after the zebras attempted to assassinate Princess Celestia. For days, Princess Luna locked herself away in her chambers, refusing meetings with every pony save her sister. On the fourth day, she called her cabinet to her, and the six mares met with the princesses for most of that day and the fifth. After they left, I was summoned. To my surprise, Princess Luna was neither wrathful, nor cold, nor overcome with remorse. She was, if I had to put a word to it, contemplative. She invited me in, offered refreshment, and made sure I was comfortable, which I was, aside from being dreadfully nervous. And then she opened up to me, telling me things I do not believe she is likely shared with any other pony outside of her inner circle, if only because it is a subject matter she chooses not to discuss. I shall endeavor to transcribe the words of Her Majesty, Princess Luna, as best as I can recall. If you were to listen to the old pony tales, they would have you believe that the conflict between Celestia and myself happened over the course of an evening, which, after a fashion, I suppose it did. But it was not a typical evening. The way it is told, one would think I threw a tantrum, or that my sister hurled me to a lunar prison at the climax of a breakfast squabble. Celestia did not choose to harness the most powerful magical energies in all of Equestria and turn them against me either lightly or swiftly. In my insanity, I gave her no other choice, and yet still she tried every other avenue to reason with me, nor was the attack unexpected and unprepared for. What the history books gloss over and the myths leave out entirely is that the morning I rebelled lasted longer than what would normally be considered a week. But there are also those who mistakenly believe that because Celestia raised and lowered my moon for a thousand years, that she is more powerful, and that her banishment of me was petty and unnecessary, as she could simply have taken the control of the moon and lowered the moon herself. But that is not the case. She could only raise my moon in all those centuries because I was not there, as I would be able to raise her son in her absence. When it comes to the night, I use an ancient term. My power trumps hers. I held my moon high and forced her son to stay down for over a week's time, and she could do nothing about it. I cannot properly convey the sense of sorrow, bitterness, and remorse that hid behind Princess Luna's voice. Yet regardless of how much private pain this revisiting inflicted, the Night Princess persevered. By the end of it, Equestria had entered a deep winter. The freezing cold was killing plants and wildlife alike, and ponies everywhere were suffering and facing death from cold or starvation. I did not care. I was in a great rage and I wanted to punish. My wrath did not just spill out onto our lands. Before the end, both the griffins and the zebras sent agents to assassinate me. But between my power and the protection of my armor, they stood no chance and I laid them low. Celestia did what she had to, and even she could not break me of my madness. Even my sister was not powerful enough or pure enough of heart to save me. It took others to do that. There is a... spark that is required to power the elements of harmony to their fullest, and it is hard to generate that spark if one is acting alone. Words cannot express the depth of emotion I felt at these revelations. The wonder and the horror of them was beyond my expression. Princess Luna gave me time to digest these things and finally to dare ask why she had chosen to confide them in such a lowly pony as myself. To be honest, there was a part of me that feared for my life. 
Such secrets were not for the likes of mere astronomers, royal or otherwise. I wish you to understand the context that I suspect surrounds the task I must ask you to undertake, she told me. You must understand two things. First, that the conflict between Celestia and myself did not happen, dare I say it, overnight. I had planned, made preparations. I had anticipated that Celestia would use the elements against me eventually, and that others would try to stop me even sooner. So I had mystical armor fashioned for myself out of the rarest and most magically stalwart of all metals. What I did not foresee is that my sister would banish me. I had expected her to attempt to strike me down, and my defenses were designed around such an assumption. I had expected my sister to be as cruel as I had become, and thus I lost. With that, she produced a small plain lockbox. She used her levitation, floating the box at a distance as if loath to touch it. Setting the lockbox before me, she opened it with yet another spell, revealing a charred and twisted scrap of metal. This is a piece of Nightmare Moon's armor. She bade me to take it, examine it. The metal was light and cool to the touch, pale blue with an extraordinary sheen that put silver to shame. I asked her where in Equestria she had found such metal. The metal is not native to Equestria. In fact, it is not native to this world at all. Every 100 years, the skies of our world are graced with a meteor shower. There was one in the year Nightmare Moon was set free, and I was saved on the longest day of the 1,000th anniversary of my incarceration. I can see that you've done the math. It is worth noting that on rare occasions, perhaps once every dozen showers, not all of the meteors burn up in the sky. There have been impacts. During the meteor shower which occurred in the year I was banished, there was one such impact in the Everfree Forest, not far from the old castle. I believe the zebra's name for this is Star Metal, and they have considerably more myths about it than we do. I want you to go to Zebra Town. You may take this with you, and learn all that you can about these myths. The zebra's reaction to my position has been more extreme than we had anticipated. For the sake of all Equestria, I need to understand why. Reading that passage while I recovered may have been a mistake. I had never envisioned what Nightmare Moon had done before. Never ever tried. Now that I did, my vision shook my soul with horror. I was in a great rage and I wanted to punish. I felt myself grow pale. I thought of myself tearing through one of the shops in Arbu, telekinetically throwing the ponies inside up against the ceiling so I could see their Arbu marks, then opening fire with the zebra rifle and releasing their burning, flailing bodies to fall to the floor. There it was. I was Nightmare Moon in miniature. But... If Nightmare Moon could become Princess Luna again, if she could lift herself from such abysmal depths of monstrosity become the loving and love-worthy goddess of our worship, then there really was hope for me. The words in the journal gave me the confidence that my hopes are more than just wishful thinking. At the same time, they were a reminder that the stain of my fury-driven murders would never fade away. Stilos was right. Like Princess Luna, I would forever remember what I had done. And like the zebras remembered the actions of Nightmare Moon, there would be those whom I could never be anything but that monster. Zenith gave me the last of the healing potions. The third medical box had been locked as well. But as it turns out, lockpicking isn't necessarily required when one of your friends has a hellhound horn capable of slashing through metal with the ease of slicing an apple. I drank it, watching the medical assist warnings on my EFS slowly die away. Next zombie zebra gets a missile up its kisser. Steelhead grumbled. I had gleaned that the battle in the pool had been frustrating, his armor refusing to allow him to fire his weapons underwater. The mental picture of two creatures who could not die from anything less than massive bodily harm being reduced to throwing hooves at each other underwater struck me as darkly amusing. I didn't think Steelhead would appreciate it if I had snickered, though. Soon, we were moving again. The bathhouse was not the prison we were looking for. Yeah, I'd find it funny. The plethora of canterlot zebras and the absence of alicorns told me that. But the basement of the bathhouse gave us an entrance into the sewers, and as much as I hated the idea of exposing ourselves to the water here, we couldn't ignore one of the most likely places for the alicorns to be holding their captives. Fortunately, since both Zenith and I had both landed in the bathhouse water with no discernible ill effect, I suspected the concentration of pink in the rainwater was low enough to be reasonably safe. Or, at least that is what I kept telling myself as soon as we were almost belly-deep in flowing rainwater. 
pushing our way through huge, dark tunnels beneath Zebra Town. From the Journal of Midnight Shower. Today, I availed myself of one of the more unique buildings in Zebra Town. The zebras have made an interesting effort to blend their cultural heritage with a more proper equestrian aesthetic. One of the results is the infamous bathhouses of Zebra Town. Water is piped in from the aqueduct, and several of the pools are boiler heated. Patrons move between hot baths and cool as they mingle and discuss the matters of the day, or enjoy a poolside brunch on the provided tables. As utterly uncouth as bathing publicly is, I must admit that the experience provided by these bathhouses is luxurious, both physically and socially. I was astonished to discover there were ponies living in Zebra Town. Only a hoofful, I am told, but there are ponies who have chosen to live their lives in this place. On purpose. I had the opportunity to converse with one such pony at the bathhouse, a delightful peasant mare named Daisy. It is Daisy's assertion that she chose to live here because the zebras need to be reminded that not all ponies are, in her words, xenophobic bigots. And on the matter of irrational fears, I found myself the subject of just such sentiments when a zebra mother screamed and pulled her full from the bath, and soon the bathhouse entirely, upon the mere sight of me. When I endeavored to determine what I had done to provoke this rather extreme response, most of the zebras would not meet my eyes out of embarrassment. One finally explained, her face reddened with shame, that the mark of the three streaking meteors on my flank was the source of the zebra's terror. It would appear that the myths of the zebras have such a hold on the psyche of some that my keto mark alone is the cause of such a reaction. Upon leaving the bathhouse, I noticed several zebra colts quickly attempting to hide an inhaler looking for all the land like they had been caught by their parents reading an issue of Wingboner magazine. I am hardly a pony to know about such things, but I suspect that they were using illegal zebra-imported pharmaceuticals. Perhaps the constables need to be keeping a better watch. Whoosh. Twin missiles shot out of Steelhoof's armor and created a battle saddle and barreled down the sewer tunnel. More than enough firepower to kill even a canterlot zombie zebra. The rockets exploded against the Alicorn's shield with almost no ill effects. Ahead of us, the cave-like tunnel continued beyond a gridwork of heavy iron bars which blocked our way. Steelhoofs and Calamity tried to occupy the purple-coated Alicorn as I hacked the wall-mounted terminal that controlled access to a heavy metal door inset in the side of the sewer tunnel. I worked as quickly as I could, hacking through the system, scanning strings of data for possible passwords. The door clanged and slid open as I found and entered the correct phrase. Not a rainbow. We charged blindly inside, Steelhoves hiding a proximity mine in the back side of the terminal before closing the door behind us and plunging into the darkness. Several pairs of glowing white lights flickered on in the darkness. My EFS compass was showing four red lights. I slipped into sats and locked onto the first zombie zebra, aiming little Macintosh right for the deadlights of its eyes. Blam. Blam. The powerful little revolver echoed in the metal chamber. Steelhoof's helmet spotlight burst to life, revealing a long, amateur laboratory filled with tables of ancient chemistry sets. The zombie zebra I had shot lay dead, most of its head removed. I really hoped it couldn't get back up from that. Three more stood about the lab, one of them holding a spear in its mouth. Steelhoof's opened fire, turning one corner of the lab into a blasting zone, filling the room with smoke, heat, and shattered glass. I quickly averted my eyes and bucked over a table, Crouching behind from the back blast of Steelhoof's attack, Calamity and Zenith joined me. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Calamity called out, covering his hat with his forelegs. Steelhoof's, thank the goddesses, stopped firing explosives. A second later, the spear struck into the table, the metal blade gleaming green as it pierced through the table, slashing my shoulder. I cried out, pressing a hoof to stop the bleeding. Calamity flew up, firing his Nova Surge rifles while Zenith pulled out healing bandages and treated my wound. I heard another explosion, but this was from outside the door. The Alcorn had tried to use the terminal and set off the mine. She wouldn't be getting in. I felt a wave of dizziness. My fear of permanent damage to my head resurfaced. But then the dizziness was joined by a gut-wrenching feeling, and I doubled over. Poison, Zenith said simply. Fear not, I know this brew. You will suffer but only a little. Then you will be as good as new. As I doubled over in agonizing cramps, I found myself strongly disagreeing with Zenith's definition of a little. 
I heard the horrible necromantic sound of the zombies he brought I had shot getting back up. Calamity fired again, and I heard it liquefy. The last zombie zebra left over the table, turning to face Zenith and me. I tried to focus, aiming little Macintosh, but a tearing, twisting pain in my abdomen obliterated my concentration, leaving me gasping for air and praying for unconsciousness. Zenith moved swiftly, striking at the zombie zebra with a hoof. How there's so many I zombie saw her zebras? I eyes widen fear as the monster failed to be paralyzed, taking advantage of her attack and sinking its teeth into her back, just beneath one of the shoulder blades. Do not touch me! Zenith screamed, twisting away, her coat and flesh tearing bloodily as she pulled herself from the teeth of the monster. She whipped her head about, the hellhound horn slicing at the zombie zebra. Her attacker's head tumbled from its body and rolled, stopping in front of my face, the dead lights in its eyes fading out as it stared lifelessly at me. Zenith screamed again, pounding her hooves against the corpse. A moment later, she speared the dead zombie's head with her hellhound horn and flung it across the room. It hit a box full of inhalers, knocking it over and spilling them all across the floor. Zenith collapsed next to me, trembling and breathing hard, blood flowing freely down her back. What just happened? From the Journal of Midnight Shower. Inquiries are proceeding at an abysmal pace. Very few zebras seem to know much about their homeland's folklore. And I have received more than one admonishment for using that phraseology, the zebras insisting that Equestria is their homeland. It would seem that a large portion of the town's population are either unschooled in their heritage, or have chosen to abandon anything that would tie them to the zebras we are currently fighting, including an adamantly feigned ignorance about any aspects of their homeland's culture and religion. I can't blame them. There have been a number of small incidents since I've arrived. These have mostly been spray painting, broken flower pots, trampled gardens, and other minor harassments. But I do understand that a constant air of intolerance, perpetuated by an insignificant few, can have an impact on the general psyche. The soldiers who are charged with protecting the residents from such incursions are more worrisome than the hooligans themselves. I've come to learn that a few of the newly assigned mares and bucks served to Shattered Hoof Ridge. I will be writing a correspondence before the week is out, suggesting that perhaps it would be a better idea to rotate out any member of our military recently involved in a battle with the Striped. Remember this place, little one, Zenith said softly as Calamity inexpertly applied Zenith's blood-stopping goop and the last of our bandages. I will want to return here. I nodded as I opened the laboratory's wall safe. I had hoped for more medicine, but instead I found a revolver, ammo, a few decaying books, and a recipe for making dash. I gave the last to Zenith, taking the ammo for myself. I took a moment to mark the lab on my pitbox auto map before trotting up to the wall terminal that operated the door on the opposite side of the labs. This one was a lot easier to hack. The door slid open. Zenith moved slowly, letting the bandages mend her wound as best it could. The zombie zebra had gotten more flesh than meat, but she still needed a healing potion, and we'd used all we had scavenged burning off the effects of the pink cloud. She edged up to an intact chemistry set and opened her satchel, pulling out jars of ingredients and strips of blood-winged leather. Seeing that Zenith was preparing a brew, I turned to Calamity. Steel and I'll scout ahead. You stay here with Zenith. Calamity's enclave weapons had proven the best we had against zombie zebras in the enclosed space. There were two puddles of glowing goop on the floor that would never get up again. I closed the door to the laboratory behind us. Now that I knew the passwords, access would be easy, and I didn't want to give our enemies easy access. We moved forward. Water spilled into the tunnel through countless pipes and gutter holes. Thunder echoed through the sewers for long seconds after each crack from the sky outside. With all the noise, even Steelhose was almost able to be stealthy. We turned a corner and stopped, seeing the glittering wall of an alicorn shield covering the passage ahead. On the other side of the shield, the water level had built up until it filled the entire passage. Two dark green alicorns sat motionlessly in front of the shield, flanking the tunnel like guardian statues. What in the... With a burst of light, the dark purple teleporter appeared between her two green sisters. She was bleeding from wounds caused by the terminal explosion. Steelhose dropped into a battle stance. I pulled out my sniper rifle, kicking onto my targeting spell, hoping I could get a shot off before she could put up her shield. Gotcha. She grinned wickedly, her horn flaring as she vanished in a flash, taking the two other alicorns with her. The shield spell disappeared, and the wall of water came rushing at us. I kicked. 
fighting to break the surface of the rushing river as it washed me violently through the zebra town sewers. My head pushed above water, and I gasped for air in the moment before I was pulled under again. My body twisted about in the swift, churning water, and my sense of direction was torn away. I felt my body slam into a set of iron bars. My head began to throb, a terrible pressure building in my horn, agony filling my ears. I tried to use the bars as a guide and push myself to the surface, lungs burning, desperate for air. Instead, my horn hit the floor of the sewer, sending a spasm of pain through my head. I gasped, drinking water into my lungs and beginning to drown. In a panic, I reversed my direction and pushed myself up as hard as I could. My head burst through the water, the rushing underground river pressing me hard against the grating. I coughed up water, my head splitting in pain, my horn feeling like it was about to explode. My eyes were red with bloody tears. Oh, goddess is a broadcaster. I was pinned. I couldn't swim away. Gasping, my mind crying in the most exquisite pain, I forced myself to dive back down. I opened my eyes, looking around in the murky, fast-moving water, and quickly spotted the skeletons of several ponies, or possibly zebras, who'd washed up against the iron bars. One of them had a pit buck on his foreleg. As swiftly as I could, my vision doubling as the pony in my head screamed, I tore the skeletal foreleg away, pit buck and all, and twisted it, pushing it between the bars. The torrent washed away the pit buck and its corrupted broadcaster. I lurched back above the waves, coughing heavily, the pain in my head instantly gone, save for the lingering headache. Through the iron bars, I could see the cold gray light of the stormy day, the water spilling out of the end of the drainage tunnel I was trapped in. I panted harshly, letting the water pin me against the bars until the deluge lessened to a breast-high stream. Something hard and metal dug into my rump. I moved, and then felt in the water with my hooves. My sniper rifle. A few minutes later, a single white light cut through the darkness of the tunnel behind me. At first, I thought it was a one-eyed zombie zebra, but then I recognized Steelhoof's helmet spotlight. My friend trotted towards me, splashing in the sewer river. From the Journal of Midnight Shower My research is beginning to bear fruit. Apparently the most knowledgeable zebra in town regarding the old tales is currently being held prisoner in the Zebra Town Police Station. Although the shopkeeper I spoke to is either unable or unwilling to comment on the crimes for which he's being held. I will be attempting to gain an audience with the prisoner tomorrow. Nearly a month into my exile, and as much as I miss the castle, there's something about this strange, dirty little peasant town that's growing on me, albeit not in an altogether pleasant way. The shopkeepers no longer look at me with suspicion, and I enjoyed a crisp hay lunch with Daisy this afternoon. However, it is becoming increasingly clear that, despite the constable's insistence to the contrary, this town has a deeply embedded contraband problem. There have been three deaths in the outlying farmlands within the last three weeks that can all be connected to the newly banned drug called Dash. The deaths involve one overdose and two shootings, the latter both by the same individual who was high on the drug at the same time she committed the murders. Combine this with a few of my own observations within the town, and I am becoming confident that Zebra Town has its hooves deep in either the distribution or possibly even manufacturing of this dangerous substance. On the way home, I noticed a couple ponies trying to sneak into town carrying what looked like bottles of liquor. Their behavior was suspicious enough that I stopped them and began asking their business in town loudly enough that one of the nearby soldiers couldn't help but take note. Unsurprisingly, these ponies quickly remembered an appointment elsewhere. No more exploring the sewers. At least, not until every other possibility had been exhausted. The Alicorns had shown just how easily they could turn into a death trap. Since when did Alicorns say gotcha? I asked standing shakily on the cobblestone street of Zebra Town in a few inches of water. After what I have been through, I wasn't so concerned about getting wet anymore, no matter how many ribbons of pink I could see in the water. Pyrolite circled overhead, seeming happy to see us again. We had managed to get separated from Zenith and Calamity, and I was dreading having to go back down to find them. No, better that I send Steelhoofs to fetch them. He, at least, couldn't drown. I looked around, realizing I had lost track of my metal-clad companion. The Applejack's ranger had been standing right next to me a moment ago. Turning, I spotted him standing at the edge of the side of a road, staring at his hoof silently. I trotted up, asking if he was alright. I died here, 
he said, before falling into a long, strange silence. From the Journal of Midnight Shower I was on my way to meet with the local constabulary when I was forced to alter my normal approach due to several large pony-drawn wagons blocking the street. Not being in a rush, I decided to take the scenic way around, taking the opportunity to locate and browse a store I had heard of, nestled in the back corner of Zebra Town, which reputedly sells a replica ceremonial zebra masks. I believe the proprietor of such a store would naturally possess a wealth of knowledge about zebra customs and, by extension, beliefs. My plans for the afternoon were quickly disrupted by muffled calls for help. Apparently a few of Equestria's finest decided to have their way with a rather comely zebra mare. By the time I arrived on the scene, the bucks were on the ground, sprawling before their very angry commanding officer. A sergeant by the name of Applesnack, whom I later learned was one of the soldiers transferred here after Shattered Hoof. From the way one of the soldier bucks held his ribs as he limped away, it was clear the sergeant had chosen a non-vocal means of intervening in the would-be assault. Although, he certainly had some choice words for them after he bucked them flat. What had the greatest impact on Damn. Them, however, was what happened after. I was taking note of the sergeant's name with the intention of recommending some manner of accommodation when the zebra mare, shaken and sobbing, reached out a hoof to thank him. Sergeant Applesnack rounded, pushing her away and informing her that he stopped those bastards because they were a disgrace to Equestria, and most emphatically not for the likes of her. I feel another letter is in order this time addressed directly to the princess herself. Steelhoof's gaze was fixed on the stones of the road before him. In the cobblestones, I saw four hoofprints. They looked like they had been melted into the stones themselves. Slowly, Steelhoof stepped forward, placing a hoof into each of the indentations. I felt an odd shudder as I saw they matched him perfectly. He looked upwards towards the specter of Canterlot, directly above us. I was here the day Equestria died, he said slowly. I stood still, listening. Mm. We knew the end was coming. Applejack and I were here evacuating every pony and zebra we could. Stable 3 was locked behind the princess's shield, but there were others nearby. He turned to me. You cannot imagine what it is to look up and see the missiles slamming into the shield around Canterlot, trying to break their way in and kill every pony inside. He looked away. Then we got word that the zebras had wiped Cloudsdale out of the sky. Applejack excused herself and raced to Ponyville. I... He gave a shuddering sigh. I never blamed her for leaving, or for ordering me to stay. There was no pony to blame except for myself. From the timber in the stoic ghoul's voice, I could tell my friend was actually crying. My heart went out to him, unable to bear hearing my stalwart Applejack's ranger finally unable to hide his hurt. We had been trying to repair our relationship ever since the night she had seen the darkness in me. I wanted to save us, but the damage was too deep. She could hardly look at me anymore. I didn't understand why she was fighting to keep us together when I didn't deserve her. But then, I didn't know she was pregnant, either. I wanted to hold him, to comfort him somehow, but I knew he wouldn't be able to feel it. That armor of his separated him from the rest of us. All I could do was be some pony who was here, and who would listen. Steelhose tried to shake off his sorrow. I remained here. She left me in charge of the evacuation in her absence. I had been in Zebra Town before. I knew the place. None of the other troops had the familiarity with Zebra Town. I was the logical choice. He looked up, remembering as he spoke. My mind's eye insisted on painting a picture from his words. The princess's shield was huge, he reminded me. Several hundred yards above the city, the shield bisected the waterfalls that poured down into Canterlot. All that water came down and had no place to go. It pulled at the bottom of the shield as the missiles began impacting above. Water absorbs the pink cloud all too readily. When the shield collapsed, that water fell down on Zebra Town like a tidal wave from the sky. Except the water was saturated pink. That wave washed over the town and every pony. Everyone left inside of it. He looked down again, stepping back from the indentations and the cobblestones his voice carrying a paid nostalgia that told me just how much he didn't like being in this place. 
I was standing right there. From the Journal of Midnight Shower. My correspondence to Princess Luna continues to go unanswered. I took the star medal into one of the town's jewelers for their appraisal, only to find myself kicked out of her shop and told never to return. This from the same mare who swore not six days ago again, that she neither knew nor cared a thing about the old zebra tales. I was just leaving when a chariot raced by, drawn by a very familiar looking pony as two others hurled burning bottles and shouted anti-zebra epitaphs, too foul to solemn myself repeating. One of the bottles crashed through the window of the jewelry shop, setting it ablaze. Doing what any good pony would have done, I tried to gallop to the shopkeeper's aid, but she fought me off, tossing a silver tea set at me before fleeing out the back entrance. I suffered smoke inhalation and some minor burns, but nothing serious. The shopkeeper was likewise relatively unharmed. Not all were so lucky. The small zebra filthy was caught in one of the fires and remains in the hospital, badly burned. The hospital here is poorly equipped and sparsely staffed but they're doing what they can with healing poultices from zebra recipes you likely won't find in the books at the Atheniums of the Ministry of Arcane Sciences. The zebra filly shares the hospital with one of her attackers. Two of the ponies are being held in the Zebra Town Police Station until a transfer wagon arrives. Again, we have Sergeant Steelhoof to thank. The sergeant responded to the attack by drawing his sidearm and shooting the mare pulling the chariot in the leg. I must take a moment to praise Zebra Town's firefighting force, who had the flames under control before the fires could spread to the nearby buildings. I spent most of the evening with the local constabulary, repeating endlessly my accounts of the events. I attempted to use the opportunity to learn more about the Zebra prisoner they have sealed in isolation, my efforts at gaining an actual audience having come to naught. This evening, one of the Zebra constables deemed to inform me that the prisoner was charged with smuggling contraband into Equestria, as well as another charge that I believe can be translated as... heresy. When I questioned whether the contraband was related to the increasing number of Dash-related incidents, the constable abruptly denied any connection between Zebra Town and the local drug problem, proclaiming the influx of Dash was almost certainly coming from someone associated with the nearby veterinary pharmaceuticals company. Instead, the constable insisted that the contraband, in this case, amounted to a book. When I asked if I might see the book in question, stating that it might shed some light on my research, the zebra informed me that he would be more than happy to oblige me were it not for the unfortunate fact that the Ministry of Image confiscated the book, removing it from their contraband vault a few scant days before. Heresy. I had a very dark suspicion of what that meant, and what book had been taken from the zebra's contraband vault. We were headed into the Canterlot ruins to get oh. that very black book. From Rarity The Black Book was in that town. Holy shit. Oh god, the Black Book. Well anyway, just to shed more light on right now. We just learned a little bit more about Steel Hooves personality a little more. He wanted to be a better man than he was. He wanted to be better than what darkness he sees himself in, and he he wanted to bring his relationship with Applejack back. But, and you can tell the kind of person he is by the words that he used to describe the day the bombs fell, and the spot where he was infused and became a ghoul. He called he he had said that he had died there. You can feel. I, I felt the hurt that Steel Who's is feeling right now. Holy shit. Anyway, we gotta continue. Secret safe at the behest of the Trixie Goddess. I did not know what my plans were from that point, but I had made it very clear to myself that getting the Black Book to Maripony was crucial. Calamity and Zenith had rejoined us, and now we were crouched in the ruins of a nameless shop. Staring across the cobblestone plaza at the Zebra Police Station. Thanks to the Journal of Midnight Shower, I had gotten the idea that this was the best place to look for the Alcorns and their prisoners. I heard a soft ding behind me as Calamity raided the store's bits register. I didn't even bother shaking my head. I pulled out my binoculars, looking the Zebra Town Police Station over. The aqueduct ran right behind the station, and part of it had collapsed, taking about a fourth of the building with it. The remains of the Zebra Police Station stood in two separate sections connected only by the basement. I spotted an alicorn on the roof of the larger section. 
This was the place. I looked at the front door and realized immediately that we would need another point of access. Not because of guards or a lock, but because the metal of the double doors had warped, fusing into each other. I suspected that the collapsing aqueduct had poured a heavy amount of pink water into the police building, causing all manner of mischief. Which section do you believe they're holding my daughter in? Oh, that's easy. Calamity answered for me. Whichever section we don't try first. From the Journal of Midnight Shower. My efforts to find the little shop that sells zebra ceremonial masks have been again thwarted by the combination of obscure, local, and conflicting directions. To an extent, I can understand and forgive the zebras for their aggravation. Any business steeped in the heritage of their native land would increase the negative perception of equestrian zebras and likely become a magnet for attacks like the one yesterday. I was able to encourage a young buck to speak with me in return for my discretion regarding a transaction between himself and several foals, wherein inhalers were exchanged for bits. Not only do I have a possibly more accurate description of the store's locale, but the buck divulged a few slippery tenets of the striped mindset regarding Princess Luna. For example, according to Zebra folklore, the Princess Luna's madness and depths of evil could only be explained by, and he said this in a derisive tone, clearly scoffing at such superstitions, external forces. When I queried him further, asking what he meant by external forces, he laughed and responded, The stars, you silly pony, the stars. In an attempt to engender camaraderie, I suggested that if he really wished to rebel against the foolishness of his elders, he could always get a star-shaped tattoo. To my surprise, he grew upset. His words, minus the unnecessary and rather crude epithets, amounted to, I mock their old religion because I am smarter than they are, not because I'm stupid. After that, I could get nothing further from him. This brings to mind a tangentially related bit of local gossip. The mayor who took the bullet to the leg died last night. The official statement claimed ill-defined complications. If the rumor is true, she went into dash withdrawal during surgery. In a small way, the attack was the zebra's own fault. And on that topic, I passed Sergeant Steelhoves on my way to the markets. This time was busily scrubbing down his combat armor. Some pony had vandalized it most egregiously by painting stripes on the protective plates and scrawling zebra lover on one of the boots. I offered my commiseration. It was completely unfair that he should be suffering ridicule for the stalwart performance of his duties, something I feel the majority of the soldiers here neglect more often than not. Tossing the scrub brush, he spat and told me, I hate this town and I'll be happy to leave it. A place like this makes it hard to simply hate zebras and love ponies. We conversed a short while, and during the course of the discussion, I found myself proclaiming the belief that these zebras were equestrian citizens, like any pony, and deserve no less than love and friendship. After all, it is not their fault they were born with stripes. They had no choice in the matter. If they did, I'm sure they would have chosen to be ponies. It is not as if they're making a fashion statement, after all. I have always been a very open-minded and egalitarian pony, after all. He replied, True, but I am a soldier. He spoke as if it behoves a soldier to only think of zebras as the enemy, and nothing more. Perhaps there's wisdom in that, but if so, it makes me thankful that I am not a military pony. This is the last you'll see of me. I volunteered for a special assignment with the Ministry of Wartime Technology. My wagon pulls out this weekend, and I will never set hoof in this wretched town again. Equestria willing, I'll never have to play pleasant with the zebra ever again. Zebra Town, I suspect, will be worse off for his absence. I stopped reading, my ears perking at the sounds of exploding missiles at least two blocks away. I whispered a quick prayer for steel hooves. Surely the mighty Alicorn Hunter wouldn't have difficulty taking down one Alicorn. I hoped. I quickly chided myself for worrying. Steelhose was the most resilient ghoul pony creature thing in the entire wasteland. I should have more faith in my friends. But still, I worried for their safety any time a plan called for anyone other than me to be the one taking the risks alone. Calamity would probably clop me upside the head if he knew what I was thinking. Hell, Homage would. Well, actually Homage would probably clop me someplace else and make me like it. And I really shouldn't be thinking about things like that at a time like this. Focus, little pip. Focus. Calamity, Zenith, and I pushed through what had once been an interior door in an upper floor of the Zebra Town police station. The collapse had left the door exposed to the outside, giving us our point of ingress. Pyrolite flew in behind us silently. At this point, our efforts relied on stealth, 
so Steelhoofs had volunteered to draw away the rooftop alicorn if we snuck inside. I found myself struggling to both like and dislike Midnight Shower. I suppose it didn't matter either way. The pony was long dead. Maybe I cared because the royal astronomer had been given the amazing gift of enjoying the presence of Celestia and Luna personally. Or maybe it was because this was some pony who had known Stilos at a rather difficult and important time of his life, and had made the effort to at least be cordial. However, the pony's civil bigotry continuously jarred me. And to think, this was a member of the royal castle. Before leaving him behind, I had asked Steelhoves about his first time in Zebra Town, letting him know that the journals from the Ravaged Hut had mentioned his name. The attempted assassination of Princess Celestia and the heroic death of Big Macintosh struck deeply at every pony. Among those affected the worst were those of us in Big Macintosh's company. After the Battle of Shattertoof Ridge, Steelhoves had told me, Princess Luna ordered all the soldiers involved to be stationed closer to the heart of Equestria and away from the front lines for at least half of a year. A reprieve from the war, combined with the offer of counseling. His assignment had been in Zebra Town, keeping the peace. There were faint hints of pink in the room beyond. The effects were minimal, making me feel vaguely sick, rather than the swift and cloying death that the concentrated pink we'd experienced in the bathhouse. Still, we had to move swiftly. I prayed the alicorns weren't keeping the prisoners in a contaminated section. If so, the zebras we were here to rescue were probably already dead. The first room opened into a narrow hallway. Calamity spread his wings, only to have them hit the walls on either side. Well, now this ain't fair, he grumped. Stupid zebra architecture. He looked at Zenith apologetically. No offense. None taken. We crept forward, moving from one room to the next. <laughs> Pyrolite and I took the lead, my self-levitation allowing me to clear away trip wires and disarm pressure plates that the alicorns had set up all over the upper floor. Again, the alicorn's tactics struck me as unusual. I heard voices up ahead, the strangely majestic voices of the pseudo-goddesses. Only this time, the voices were strangely different. I couldn't put my hoof on exactly why. I waved a hoof at those behind me, motioning them to stay back, and I slowly crept forward, listening. We have enough striped ponies, right? One of them said. We have. She beat her hoof on the floor eight times. That many. No, we have this many, another said, hoof tapping seven times. The scrawny one died yesterday when they went through the pink below, remember? All of the stupid ponies are scrawny, the first complained. Let us just take those we have and leave this goddess forsaken place. Wait, two. There was something odd about the way they referred to themselves. Hell, the whole conversation was bizarre. We hate it here. A third alicorn spoke up. I froze, realizing a whole damn wing of the creatures was in the room right next to me. I started to back up, trying to think of another way around. We couldn't fight them, particularly not in such cramped quarters. We were thoroughly fucked. This goddess forsaken place makes us remember things. I hate remembering things. We... The third voice continued, and all at once, I realized why their voices sounded strange. I wasn't hearing them in my head, just with my ears. Last night, I remembered I used to be a buck. Luna spanked my withers. The pink cloud was messing with their telepathy. They were cut off from the goddess's influence here. No wonder Trixie needed us to be her agents. Uh, ho, 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 ho. Then the other hoof fell. The canterlot ruins were supposed to be full of alicorns, and those alicorns didn't realize we were supposed to be friendlies. We were all sorts of fucked. I turned back, motioning the others back down the hallway. From the Journal of Midnight Shower. Today was an amazing day. After two more store owners refused to speak to me about the star medal, I finally located the ceremonial mask shop and met with the proprietor. This time, I was cautious not to produce or even mention knowledge of the medal, instead asking about zebra legends surrounding the meteor showers, explaining away my curiosity with my cutie mark. In return, the old zebra mare told me plenty albeit in hushed tones and only after pulling me into the back room and closing up her store. She spoke of how the zebras believe that the stars themselves are the visible avatars of unholy entities, so unfathomable that our minds would crack should we perceive even more than a mere notion of them. Beings of such primordial and loathsome will that all the evils of our world are no match for their vileness and cruelty. Much of this I had already heard before, 
but not in so chilling a fashion, nor with such utter conviction. Among the most interesting of her tales was the story thousands of years old, telling of one of the first Zero Cities, and how it was destroyed by several meteor impacts during the earliest recorded meteor shower. The city had been the Zero's hub of trade and politics, and its destruction plunged the nation into hundreds of years of tribal civil wars. I do believe that the events of this tale, if true, represent the historical roots of what has become the dominant Zero mythology. I had settled down on a park bench near the Celestia Fountain, a uh, Zebra's rather hoof-forward way of saying, we're equestrians too, I suspect, when one of those huge new model world gigs, the Griffin Chaser 5, descended out of Canterlot, landing on the far side of the Zebra Town Commons. Now, despite my position as Royal Astronomer, I had never actually seen one of the Ministry Mayors. Today, I saw two. Fluttershy, Mayor of the Ministry of Peace, emerged from the passenger compartment along with eight other ponies, five of whom were carrying pink suitcases. Pinkie Pie, Mayor of the Ministry of Morale, stepped down from one of the six pedal positions and ordered the heavily laden ponies to follow her as she marched through the front gate leading to one of the zebra huts, opening a door as she went inside. Fluttershy politely requested the company of the remaining three and departed straight for the hospital. Half an hour later, Pinkie Pie's five ponies emerged from the house, stowed their suitcases in the Griffin Chaser, and began going door to door throughout the neighborhood. Not long after, Pinkie Pie herself emerged from the house, closing the door behind her, trotting up to the front gate, and planting something at the base of the gate underneath netting designed to look like dirt, then kicked some real dirt onto it for good measure. Then the mayor of the Ministry of Morale proceeded to disguise herself as a trash can, with a fake beard. I must admit that it was amusing. <laughs> I'll admit, I allowed Pinkie my Pie. curiosity to get the better of me. I sat on that bench for over an hour, watching the bearded trash can watch the empty and apparently booby-trapped hut. My patience was rewarded when Fluttershy and her ponies returned, escorting a happily stunned zebra couple as their little tiny filly dodged about their legs. I had not seen the filly until after she had been horribly burned, and it is doubtful that I would have recognized her even if I had, as zebras all tend to look alike. But it was not difficult to deduce who the filly must be. Likewise, it became swiftly evident that the hut invaded by the Ministry of Morale earlier was her home. Even then, I was not ready for the explosion triggered when the little filly stepped onto Pinkie Pie's concealed pressure plate. I suspected they would be cleaning up confetti from Zebra Town Commons for weeks. Not to mention streamers from several of the rooftops. Okay, 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 I got confused. The little filly was utterly delighted. After she crawled out from behind her parents' hooves, at least. The blast of trucks Whoa! nearly had me cowering under the bench. Zebras poured out of nearby huts, although I was not sure how That's many did so washer, on account of the invitation, or how many were just trying to make sure the town wasn't being bombed, but the vast majority of them joined in the festivities regardless. It all brought a smile to my face, even if zebra fillies have a very different preference for party music than proper cantalot pony. The only one, in fact, who was not smiling was Pinkie Pie herself, but I suspected that may have been because she had thrown such an amazing party and didn't have any time to stay and enjoy it. The two Ministry Mayors and their company were lifting on the air with that six-pedal pony flyer before the filly ever got a chance to cut the cake. I crouched to the lock of the Zebra Town Police Station's contraband vault, thinking as I worked. Pinkie Pie took surprise parties to a whole new level. I found myself thinking of the party trap on the roof of the GRHAS building, wondering what sort of party she might have been setting up. A... Welcome back, sorry the alligators bit your leg party for one of the hatchery staff, perhaps? Or merely a birthday party for some pony working there? Or maybe just a birthday party for one of the alligators? I shook my head. Gummy! No, I couldn't imagine even Pinkie Pie throwing a party for an alligator. That would just be silly. She has Gummy, the alligator! I into place and the door opened. I stepped inside, turning on the light of my pit buck and taking a deep breath as I enjoyed the stale but pink-free air inside. Mmm... My eyes fell on all the weapons, and I stopped, stunned. Whoa, Nelly, Calamity whispered. I could only nod. I was pretty sure the zebras were never supposed to have this kind of armament. If the ponies of Canterlot ever had any idea that the striped equestrian citizens just beneath them were stockpiling something like this. They was fixing to fend off an invasion, Calamity said softly. <sighs> Zenith nodded. Most likely, they feared the ponies of Canterlot would eventually come for them. The guns are on, real bad condition, Calamity said regretfully. But I reckon we could fix them up right good, take out some of the good parts, uh, maybe about two dozen. Take them all, I said, suddenly getting an idea. 
I started unlocking one of the weapons lockers. Everything you can repair to something good. A moment later, I had the locker open and was staring at the... thing inside. What is this? Zenith peeked over my shoulder and said simply, Balefire Egg Launcher. A what? I rocked on my hooves. Sure enough, one of the ammo boxes I unlocked later held several Balefire Eggs. Taking them, I floated up the BEL. I'll be right back, I told the others before creeping back into the pink. A few minutes later... Is this the equivalent to the big boy? Is that what this is? Is this the equivalent to the big boy? Oh god, oh, I'm thinking the most evil things I can do with this thing if I was in this situation. Oh god, I just realized how often I do evil shit in Fallout. Oh well. Later, I made my way back to the hall doorway. The alicorns were still talking inside. I stepped around the corner as Sats activated, and was pleased to see one of the alicorns was a purple one with a recognizable set of wounds. Gotcha. From the Journal of Midnight Shower. I received an official decree from Princess Luna today, in response to my latest reports. By this document of authority, signed by the Princess herself, the local constabulary is required to let me interview any prisoner in its custody. I noticed an oddness about the town. It was as if the entire place was abandoned. All of the stores were mysteriously closed. I proceeded directly to the Zebra Town Police Station, only to find the door shut and locked from the inside. It occurred to me that today must be some sort of zebra holiday. Considering the dark and ominous tones to most of their mythology, it does stand to reason that their holidays would be somber and fearful affairs. Although even then, the closing of the police offices seemed exceptionally weird. Ponies would never shut down vital services just because of a date on the calendar. In my dream, I was a little bit with the zebra. I trotted about the zebra city. Not Zebra Town, which attempted to blend zebra heritage with equestrian aesthetics, but a true zebra city. A city formed in a hillside forest, the trees themselves molded into homes and buildings after their roots had been tended with the most ancient and sacred of magical brews. The homes were marked with masks of friendship and welcome. There were no fences, just carvings blessing the home and warding off monsters. Gardens of vegetables and herbs stretched around each home, and flasks hung from the branches. I wasn't sure how I knew that this was how a proper zebra city looked like. Be smart. But I knew it all the same. I looked up at the bright starry night and smiled at the moon. My eyes caught onto a streak in the sky. I blinked, unsure of what I had just seen. But then there was another. One of the stars had fallen from the sky. I heard gasps and murmurs from the other zebras around me. I had not been the only one to see it. Other zebras, my friends and neighbors, were staring up into the sky, murdering dozens of my fellow zebras. Now there was panic. The streets were filled with my neighbors as they fled their huts, not knowing which way to run. I felt the ground shake from another impact. Wait. The forest was burning now. What, what's going out, on? Horrified, my hooves refusing to move as if I was glued to the ground. Another star, the brightest yet, tore from its rightful place in the sky, shooting down right at me. I woke with a gasp. I looked around at the rubble. Blowing up the three alicorns with a balefire egg was delicious overkill. One of them had even been fast enough to get her damn shield up before I could fire. Didn't help one damn bit. But I had been unprepared for how big the explosion would be. I'd been cautious, aiming for the wall behind the alicorns. That wall was no longer there. Nor was the floor or ceiling. The room that the alicorns had occupied as well as the rooms on each side, had become a gaping maw open to the rain. I had fired and dived back behind the wall. That wall had blown into the hallway, collapsing and trapping me between it and the other. I checked the medical assist spell and was surprised to find that, while battered and bruised, nothing was broken. I was lucky that I wasn't a smear on the wall. I looked around some. The BEL lay crushed under a chunk of wall. It was worthless now, although Calamity might be able to strip some parts of it for repair, should we find another one. I concentrated, wrapping the concrete chunk in a levitation field and lifting it away. I took the BEL, 
then used my levitation to make the broken wall weightless and pushed it away. I was dragging myself out from under the floating rubble when Pyrolite landed next to me, Calamity and Zenith not far behind. Calamity was dragging a huge sack full of weapons. From the Journal of Midnight Shower. This is no holiday. For three days, Zebra Town has been like a ghost town for me. For three days, I have sought audience with the Constabulary, and for three days, I have been denied. I know there are zebras here. I can see their shadows moving behind their windows. I spotted one zebra mare pulling her welcome mat inside before slamming and locking the door at my approach. Another hurried her filly indoors, her expression aghast as the foal attempted to smile at me. The horror. What absolute horror that her filly wanted to smile at me. Enough is enough. I have an official decree from the princess herself, and I'm going to wait outside this door until I am recognized. We waited at the bottom of the stairwell for Calamity. Our Pegasus friend was using the gaping hole I had blown in the side of the police station to fly out and stash everything he and Zenith had taken from the vault. Calamity had been right. The prisoners were not in this part of the Zebra Town police station. I had scouted the rest of it with Pyrelight, after assuring my friends that I was not as bad off as I looked. We found a few medical boxes in the station's bathrooms, and a few boxes of ammo. But there were no more alicorns, and no zebra prisoners. They were in the other section. To get to them, we had to cross the other section through the basement. Zenith drank one of the three healing potions I had scavenged, letting it work on the zombie bite. She caught me watching and smiled. Fear not, little one. I will be fine. It is good that you cannot catch a zombie from a bite, no? I nodded. Still, something in her expression felt off to me. You do not have to try to rescue them just because one of them is my daughter, nor because you feel you need to make up for the cannibal town. Wait, had she actually tried to talk me out of doing this? I turned to my zebra friend, asking cautiously, Are you alright with us doing this? What do you mean? she asked, not following my train of thought. Rescuing your daughter, I said carefully. You do want to do this, right? Zenith glared at me for a moment, but then her expression softened. Yes, of course I do. I wish my daughter to be safe. Then, dropping her voice, she admitted, I just do not know if I'm ready to do this. What do you mean? Okay, this place was bad. There were all manner of ways to die here. But just this morning, I had seen Zenith leap from a flying passenger wagon onto the back of a bloodwing in an effort to save people. It didn't seem like Zenith to be afraid of charging into danger with us. If I save her, Zenith said simply, I am responsible for her again. I remembered all those things I had dismissed as crazy zebra logic. But to my friend, they were not crazy at all. This was how things were in her world, and she was feeling cornered by impending responsibility that she didn't believe she deserved or could handle. Zenith, we have to, I explained lamely. We can't let them die, even if rescuing them costs us something we aren't ready to give yet. I know that, little one. It does not make this any easier for me. I nodded. Then try to put it out of your mind for now. Focus on what we have to do, and we'll deal with the consequences when they come. Calamity returned. I unlocked the basement door and pushed it open with a hoof. The basement was full of pink cloud. Crap. I closed oh, the door no. again, taking a few breaths. Then looked at Calamity, Zenith, and Pyrelight. You guys ready for this? Are you ready for this? Do, 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 From the do, Journal do, of Midnight uh. Shower. I waylaid one of the constables as she was attempting to sneak into her home after shift. Cornered, the zebra mare admitted the word had spread throughout the town. Every zebra now knew that I was in possession of star metal. Worse, they had somehow surmised that it was a fragment of Nightmare Moon's armor, which I had brought with me from Canterlot. I was immediately anxious, knowing that the proliferation of this information would put the valuable heirloom entrusted to me in great danger of theft. The next words of the striped constable, however, revealed that the reverse was true. No zebra would be willing to venture close to the accursed chunk of meteor metal, nor would they abide by my presence due to my association with the heirloom. Insanely, 
in the zebra mind, my prolonged exposure means that I am somehow contaminated, as if I had contracted a dangerously communicable disease. No stores will do business with me at this point. I am unofficially, but quite effectively, shunned. It was just a damned piece of metal. Thrusting my papers in the zebra's face, I dragged her back to the station and demanded that she facilitate my access to the prisoner. I will admit to have been perhaps excessively loud and more physically forceful than is befitting of a pony of breeding, but my efforts did provoke a response. Finally, the head of the constabulary opened the door, if only enough to poke his head out between the heavy chains that prevented me from forcing the door open farther. He took one look at my papers, agreed to the authority they provided me, but regretfully informed me that the prisoner had slain himself two nights before and would not be speaking with anyone, pony or zebra. I was not satisfied. I demanded to see the body for myself. I suspected that the zebra was lying. Or worse, I suspected foul play to prevent me from speaking with the captive zebra. To my surprise, the head of the constabulary capitulated. He withdrew and closed the door. I could hear the chains being removed. When he opened it again, all the constables had left the room. I saw them watching him from adjacent rooms like nervous foals peering into the darkness under the bed. The head constable led me through the Zebra Town police station, unlocking the door into the dimly lit stairwell. We descended, passing by the floor containing the normal cell blocks and plunging farther down until we were in the sub-basement, where the iron behemoth of the boiler was held. Beyond it, across from the coal room, was a small room, no bigger than a closet, with a heavy iron door. Inset into the door was a small barred window of thick glass, through which I could look into the shadow chamber. I could see the prisoner. The zebras had not moved him yet. They had, I am inclined to assume, been unwilling to even open the door, much less share a space with the body of the striped inside. I could not make out the writing on the wall, but I immediately knew that he had painted the scrawling letters in his own blood. I recoiled as my gaze fell upon him, certain without a doubt that the zebra had taken his own life in a fit of insanity. He had chewed through his own forehoofs, continuing to gnaw muzzle pressed into his own blood until they were attached to his forelegs by only thin strips of meat. I have no idea what unholy drive allowed him to survive long enough to do the same to both of them. The cell was midway through the basement. By the time we reached it, my heart was threatening to seize, and my lungs refused to work. My head was being ripped apart, and my flesh felt like it was trying to peel back away from my meat. I couldn't make it to the far end, and I couldn't make it back but the cell was free of the pink. All I had to do was unlock it. I fumbled, screaming in agony, and tried again. My companions pressed close, all of them dying. This time, the door opened. We all stumbled inside. The torture melted away, but my EFS was flashing all the worst messages. Without healing potions, we couldn't go back out, and we only had two left. Two of us would have to stay behind, trapped in this cell until the others could get back with healing supplies. You two go on ahead, Clammy rasped, waving a wing limply at Zenith and me. I opened my muzzle to argue, but he pushed it shut with his hoof. It's your mission more than mine, and it's only proper y'all should be the ones to see it through. Besides, you two are the best skilled for jailbreaking anywho. Zenith wobbled, looking stricken. No, it... Then she stopped, her eyes going horribly wide, all the remaining color draining from the skin beneath her coat. She wasn't staring at Calamity. Her eyes were locked on the wall behind him. I nudged past my Pegasus friend and looked at the wall. There were words there, scrawled in the rusty color of blood. But the words were strange, the letters in no language I knew. Zenith, what is it? It is a prophecy, she intoned softly, in the old language of our people. Slowly, she read, a tremble in her voice. By the light of our stars, we illuminate your end, and shine on the graves of all zebra kind. A hundred thousand nightmares will descend upon you, the armies of our dark child will fill the skies, and foes from impenetrable cities will fall upon all of your lands, shielded by armor crafted from their very souls. Rejoice with us, for every single one of you shall die. I froze, transfixed to the spot, a slow bubble of horrified realization crawling up in my mind from the blackest abyss. 
The prophecy was wrong. It was a lie. But, surely, as much as the zebras loathe anything they associate with the stars, surely a prophecy like this would have gotten back to the zebras' Kaisar and the religious leaders of their land. I had seen four stars. I knew there were zebras loyal to the homeland and ponies loyal to their cause. This would have gotten back. And when the zebras saw mega spells and alicorn shields, would they not have made the same assumption as Fluttershy did about how the spells could be used to protect their entire cities? When they learned the Black Book had fallen to Rarity's hooves, and even heard her suggest using soul jars to create invincible armor, would they be able to believe that she would abandon the project? How about the new Pegasi armor? And how would they react if they discovered that Twilight Sparkle was creating alicorns? The prophecy was a tailor-made doomsday lie designed to drive the zebras to the worst possible extremes. But how did the zebra know? How could he predict, twisted and distorted, things that were not even set into motion until after his death? The acquisition of the Black Book, in fact, was set into motion by his capture. How? Okay, it wasn't impossible. I had seen precognition level abilities before. Maybe the stars, or something, gave the zebra something equivalent to Pinkie Pie's unusual senses. Yeah. Maybe it was the influence from the Black Book, or spells that had been woven into it after it was turned into a soul jar. Maybe the zebra had been on mint owls, or something more potent than mint owls. The zebras were the ones who created those drugs Psycho? after all. Right? Or maybe... Just maybe. Maybe it didn't matter. No. Not maybe. It didn't matter. The constables here had been so terrified of this insane zebra that they hadn't been willing to unlock the door to remove the body. I looked down, and sure enough, the skeleton was still here. Midnight Shower hadn't been able to see the entire prophecy from the window. Perhaps no one ever did. It was entirely possible that we were the very first people to see the writing on the wall. And the worst part is, it didn't matter. Even if this prophecy never made it out of this room, the zebras didn't need it. The Ministry of Magic had cracked the zebras' bypass magic just a few mere weeks before the end, and already they were using it to create shields that only specific individuals could get through. Twilight Sparkle was starting pony testing of the Alicorn creating IMP formula the very day of the strikes. Once those advances happened, it was only a matter of time before Equestria had impenetrable defenses and an army of advanced Alicorn fighters, and the zebras would lose. The zebras had already lost. Equestria had won. It was only a matter of playing it out. Checkmate, in a predictable number of moves. And if the zebras truly believed that there was no possibility of surviving a surrender, that they were facing annihilation, or worse, under Nightmare Moon, and they truly did believe that, then the only move left was to blow up the board. The zebras didn't see any other choice. From the Journal of Midnight Shower. I'm almost finished packing. There's no point pursuing my research here. I will get no more cooperation from the zebras of Zebra Town. To my dismay, not even Daisy will respond to my knocking. Although I suppose she could legitimately be out of town. It doesn't matter. I have sent a message ahead to Princess Luna, informing her of my failure and my imminent return. I have ordered a royal cherry to pick me up in just under two hours. That should be enough to pack up this terminal and last of my possessions. I want to be rid of this place and back in my own bed before midnight. And there is the knock on the door. It would appear my ride is early. Well, they'll have to wait. But I will not make them wait long. And now they've upgraded their knocking to banging. Now I worry that Princess Luna is disappointed with me and wishes to see me return before I have time to pack. Or perhaps they have invitations to a soiree in Canterlot and fear I'll make them unfashionably late. It doesn't matter. I've decided I don't really need a lot of this junk anyway. I can always buy new things once I'm back in the lap of a society of reasonable ponies. Actually, all I really need are those things already in my bags, as well as the heirloom's lockbox and this terminal. I'll be ready to go as soon as I've finished writing this entry and I've shut. Zenith and I gazed upwards. The entire stairwell on this side of the building had collapsed, taking a fair bit of each floor with it. We were at the nadir of a four-story pit, looking upwards through where ceilings and floors used to be. 
Three floors up, we could see a jail cell and the young adult zebras trapped inside. Well, barely. The cell was behind a shield being generated by two familiar dark green alicorns sitting in front of it like guards, unmoving and unblinking. On the floor above, three more alicorns stood watch. Well, at least the pink cloud hadn't seeped into this part of the building and become trapped here. I was still getting nasty medical warnings on my EFS, despite having found a couple more healing potions in the constable's locker room medical box and imbibed one. Xanath drank the other. I felt slightly bad for not saving it, but by the time the two of us made it out of the basement, we couldn't have rescued any zebras. In fact, if we hadn't found those two potions, we would be needing rescue ourselves. I really hated the pink cloud. Five alicorns. Fuck. I should have seen this one coming. Alicorns normally work in groups of three. There were three in the other wing, one on the roof. That meant at least two more, and five made even more sense. How the hell were we supposed to do this? There was no way to sneak up to the cage, and we were hardly in prime fighting condition. I was working on a brilliant plan. I almost had the start of one when I heard Xanath gasp softly. Zephyr. I eeped in surprise as Xanath's teeth bit down on my name as she threw me onto her back. The zebra charged into view of the alicorns, shouting a battle cry. One after the other, the three alicorns ignited their shields and jumped down, swooping towards us. Xanath turned and ran, but not far. Hold on, little one. I wrapped my forelegs around her tightly, wondering what she intended to do. She spun, lowering her horn and started charging to meet the closest of the alicorns as it sped towards her. You're kidding, right? At the last moment, Xanath leapt. The zebra sailed through the air with me clinging onto her back for dear life. Her hooves hit the alicorn's shield and pushed off of it, keeping momentum, leaping to the next, then the third. The zebra landed on the floor in front of the two green alicorns. I was still hugging her tightly, looking back down at the three utterly surprised alicorns who had just been used as jumping platforms. Zenith reared and slashed her head from one side, then the other, slicing her hellhound horn through the throats of the two alicorns in front of her. The shield dropped. Open the door, little one, she demanded. Hurry. I blinked, still feeling stunned, and slid off of her back. I reached out with my magic, picking the lock on the cell door with casual ease. The alicorns below us were shaking off their surprise and soaring back up towards us. Do you have any more of those memory orbs, little one? I nodded. Yeah, but they won't... fall for the... But these alicorns have been cut off. They might just fall for the same trick. Stand back, I warned. Xanath dove past me into a cell, pulling off her satchel and dumping its contents it. before the wide-eyed younger Do zebra it. box and mares. Do it! I floated out all of the memory orbs I had. I heard her say, The ones like this one, each of you take one and put it on, swiftly. The alicorns were flying up at us. Staring down through the ruins at them, I flung the memory orbs into the abyss, yelling, Bale fire eggs for every monster! Yay! The three alicorns scattered. Behind me, I heard the young zebras suddenly start crying out in sharp pain. I spun around, turning my back to the chasm in alarm. What's going- I stopped, stunned yet again, not believing my eyes. And some of the zebras have magic fetishes that allow them to fly. Rarity's voice chimed sweetly in the back of my mind, speaking to the three bucks harassing Rainbow Dash. If you think it's impossible for an earthbound mare to fly her way into Cloudsdale with the right magic, you have tragically short memories. All eight zebras in front of me including Zenith herself, had grown large bat-like wings. Wow, that's... when did you... My gaze fell to the strange talisman hanging from Zenith's neck, formed in part from an inhaler, and the identical ones worn by each of the other zebras, several of whom were still wiggling and writhing as their wings grew. I realized what the blood wing strips were for. Zenith smiled at me with feigned innocence. You realize those are kinda creepy, right? I finally said, <laughs> smiling just a touch. Once again, I was riding Zenith's back, this time with my forelegs wrapped around her neck as her wings flapped on either side of me. 
Rain cascaded over both of us, soaking us. The seven other zebras were soaring behind us. We had a slight head start, but none of this lot were anything more than the most novice of flyers. The same could not be said for the three alicorns pursuing us. They swooped up out of the Zebra Town police station behind us, tossing up their shields as soon as they were airborne. Bright light and thunder cracked the air, and one of the zebras screamed as an alicorn lightning spell struck him. He fell from the sky, trailing smoke. No! I lashed out with my magic, grasping him in a telekinetic net, and drawing him back towards us. But the young zebra buck was already dead. Whoosh. Twin missiles launched from somewhere in the Zebra Town ruins below, striking against one of the alicorn shields. The monster turned her attention to steel hooves. The Zebra Town police station exploded. The blast tore upwards through the larger half of the police station, rending the building apart. The force of the blast slammed into the three alicorns, what about causing calamity? their shields to fail and knocking the one diving towards steel hooves out of the sky. The shockwave hit us, and Zenith lost control. Behind us, I heard Steelhoves taking full advantage of the Alicorn's moment of vulnerability. I threw my magic around Zenith, myself, and the six surviving Zeros, pulling up and trying to soften the crash. We landed in the amphitheater lake with a percussion of hard splashes. I gasped, struggling to paddle my way to the surface, no better at swimming than Velvet Remedy was. My head broke the surface once, barely. I sucked in a mixture of air and water as a wave hit across my muzzle. The last thing I saw was a swirling burst of green and gold flashing in the sky over where the Zebra Town police station used to be. You did what? Velvet Remedy shrieked. The rain had finally stopped, leaving the wasteland cool, gray, and wet. There were no rainbows, but the air had a fresh smell that was utterly pleasant. It was our second day back. We had arrived late in the evening, just after the rain Come on! Ended. Our return was heralded with surprise and celebration amongst the zebras of Glyphmark, while we spent the night sleeping in the morning recovering and, metaphorically, licking our wounds. I had wanted a funeral for the two zebras we had failed to save, but the Glyphmark zebras didn't want to spoil the first bright moment in their recent lives with thoughts of mourning. Instead, we turned our efforts to helping this town in the ways we could before we left. This time, I wasn't helping those in need only to walk away. Calamity looked up from the military robot he was repairing and tipped his hat. I blew up the big old boiler they had in the basement. Steel has worked along Calamity like got out? Accessing the robot with his magically powered armor through a pit buck technician tool that I had let him borrow. The Applejack's Ranger was reprogramming each of the robots in the Angel lot that Calamity could get working right, turning them into guards for the town of Glyphmark. Velvet Remedy stammered, looking utterly aghast. Hey, I knew I couldn't make it to any of the other exits, but I figured I could make it to the other three yards from the cell to the boiler, throw all the right switches and turn all the right knobs and make it back to the cell before keeling over. He grinned sheepishly, adding, And, you know, open the furnace up so Pyrelake could fly inside. Pyrelake cooed happily. Of the lot of us, she was the best for wear, having been nicely incinerated in a fire of her own making. Wh why well, I figured little Pip and Zenith had their cells full as it was, and we didn't want any pony getting dead trying to save us, Calamity explained. So I thought, hey, a boiler explosion's mostly steam, ain't it? And we seen how the rain washes away a pink cloud, so I reckon a steam explosion would clear the basement cloud right quick. But, but, you could have been killed. Well, the cell looked real sturdy. I figured it'd hold. Calamity grinned, blushing. Of course, we got a hell of a bigger bang than I was expecting. Good thing the blast mostly went straight up. That's insane! Velvet Remedy stomped, trapped between a relief that Calamity was alive and desire to strangle him for enacting such a reckless <laughs> plan. The softer voice of Zephyr intoned, That is the friend of yours whose name is Calamity, right? Zenith trotted past Calamity with Zephyr and several of the other town zebras in tow. Her daughter stared at the Pegasus as they passed, and Calamity tipped What was his hat cutie mark again? Please meet you, Miss Zephyr. Zenith was leading the group of zebras down to the labs beneath Angel Bunny Pharmaceuticals. I wasn't sure how I felt about Zenith teaching the town of Glyphmark how to manufacture Dash, 
but I had given in to her argument that the town needed something they could sell to merchants in exchange for food and supplies. This was her way of trying to be responsible for them. We were losing Zenith, but only for a short while. She was going to stay behind in Glyphmark, spending some time with her daughter and helping the Glyphmark tribe while the rest of us tackled the Canterlot ruins. The Canterlot ghoul paused in his work, looking up at Calamity. And how did you know the boiler would still work? Well, I was kind of counting on it not working right, actually. That's kind of how you get them to explode, after all. Velvet turned and hissed at Pyrelight. I can't believe you would take part in something so... so... insane! <laughs> the Balefire Phoenix looked slightly abashed, but Sounds like something was I proud do. of herself. Velvet Remedy tossed her mane back, stuck her nose high in the air, and harumphed. I listened to each of them. I just realized how face. similar to... Then turned back to the zebra standing in line next to me. I, I just realized how similar to Rarity she is. Calamity had rebuilt from the mess of weapons we had scavenged from the police station's contraband vault. Now watch closely, I instructed, beginning their first lesson on marksmanship and firearm safety. They all looked at me intently, eager to learn how to defend themselves and their town. For the first time in Goddess's know-how long, there was a sense of hope in Glyphmark. Well, wow. that was a pretty awesome chapter. Like, there was some good stuff, there's some funny stuff. Like, there was probably a lot of... What's the word? Firefights, I guess is the right word for this. But that, that was a pretty awesome chapter. Well, anyway, guys, this chapter is pretty fucking long. And I hope you guys enjoyed it. And I'll catch you guys later. Stay nerdy, my friends. Bye!